Hey guys welcome back to another exciting video so seat back relax and let's get started. Harlecking 31, Stain has a quirk yeah, but it's only paralyzing people when he drinks their blood. He displayed insane amounts of durability, speed, and strength in his fight, not to mention spatial awareness, which weren't related to his quirk. Plus he got pretty resourceful with a couple of cheap homemade support items. And Aizawa fights quirkless against everyone. He just evens the playfield against some of his opponents. He learned his fighting style with the capture tool through sheer training. And there's a black market of support items going on. Surely getting your hands on some decent equipment for an acceptable isn't all that difficult if you really put your back into it, or villains wouldn't be getting s. Re. Fair. If anything, he exists in a place above and beyond IRL Olympian athletes. As for his cheap homemade support items, they're just knives and swords and shit he hasn't properly maintained since his appearance in My Hero Academia, Vigilante. Aizawa similarly being able to leap to and from power lines is impressive, as is his martial arts ability. However, the current issue is that my C reincarnated into the body of an 11-year-old who'd been napping in the coma ward for a year. So it's not like under ordinary circumstances he could reach Stain and Aizawa's levels of superhuman ability, not without seriously stunting his growth. As for illegal support items, that requires startup capital, Lomi coffee, not much for me to say but that I'm liking your headcanon for this so far. Ooh, don't worry kid. The readers will have B in your place. Fantastic and irritating to be aware that something is hot but your body isn't able to react just yet. Ew, aftershocks of placing a soul in a new body. Re, puberty in of itself is a living hell for one who's been through that awkwardness already. And you can't really tackle that in anything other than an ice guy story. That or just a very specific circumstance. As for what capped the previous chapter. Uh huh. As I'd said to myself the night before, I left tomorrow's problem for myself to deal with the next day. Sure, anyone half my physical age would have been shouting from the rooftops if a quirk-like event manifested itself, but it had been late and I didn't want to drag anyone out of bed. Way I figured it, if it wasn't a one-off, what was potentially my quirk wasn't going anywhere. If it was a one-off caused by Dane Bramage, better I found out in the morning where everyone was amenable and not dragged out of bed in the middle of the night. It was important to treat people the way you wanted to be treated, because that shit did pay forward. I mean, Ice Gates was real, so that meant karma was a thing. Right, right, moving on. With all that in mind, once Hitomi had arrived for her morning check-in, the staff and I got to work to see if what happened last night in front of the bathroom sink was my quirk. The lazy option to check for this sort of thing was to take an x-ray of both feet and see whether or not a certain joint in the pinky toe was absent. However, that method's infallibility had been disproven years ago since it didn't account for latent quirks, quirks that manifested not through the body's maturation like the X-gene in Marvel but instead activated in response to external stressors like the metagene in DC Comics. Though in my opinion, a missing toe joint just seemed like lazy, lazy writing. The more accurate, labor-intensive option was to run blood work in, or tissue samples and seek out the plus alpha, the quirk factors summing the physical and genetic traits that composed a person's quirk, say a person had. Not only would their body have the instructions to convert chemical energy into thermal energy, the body would also have the instructions to create the necessary insulation to stop you from cooking yourself from the inside out. On the inverse however, quirks didn't always come with secondary powers that made them actually usable. Sometimes a person with a fire quirk would utterly lack the necessary or to make use of their quirk, so they would either exhaust themselves, or in the worst case, inflict crippling first or even third degree burns on themselves. A person who could protrude bone spikes like the wolverine frog might lack the healing quirk necessary to close up after they retracted a aforementioned bone spikes. A person who could fire concussive blasts from their eyes might utterly lack the bracing necessary to use their quirks without snapping their necks and killing themselves, if they were lucky. The above cases were known as secondary quirk dysfunction, a percentage of meta-abilities expressing this property. Sometimes a person could grow out of that phase through the natural maturation that came with growing up into an adolescent or to adulthood, as a more mature body was simply better suited to handling the power. Like how Kid Goku in Dragon Ball GT could still use his transformation, but his 10-year-old body wasn't mature enough to handle that much power running through it. On the inverse, a quirk could remain self-destructive no matter how mature the body was. The concept of quirks in of itself was fascinating, even if only from a spectator's point of view. However, happening upon the quirk singularity theory by now disgraced quirkologist, Hudai Garaki during the course of my studies. While the theory itself isn't a popular one, given this new world places so much value on how strong one's quirk is in, or how well one can control it, at the very least I can understand why people would want to bury their heads in the sand on such a subject. If quirks became something rampant, 
uncontrollable, it could undo the quote-unquote peace this world has managed to achieve. The even less popular quirk extinction theory, a follow-up to Kudai Garaki's work by another quirkologist, postulates that as quirks continue to grow stronger and more complex, so too would the level of quirk-related violence. This could either be caused by mental disorders brought about by the onset of quirks requiring more processing power than an unaugmented brain could provide, or just their sheer destructive capability that the older generation can't hope to match and the temptation they're in. That was the short term. In the long, the growing complexity of quirks and violent incidents could result in either the complete extinction of all mankind as mass conflicts and hysteria broke out, or the self-destructive end of all those with paranormal powers leaving those without quirks to pick up the pieces after the literal and or metaphorical first stopped flying. This part of the quirk extinction theory was doubly unpopular because of the religious undertones it brought to mind. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Matthew 5-5 And make no mistake, mothers could still lift their cars off of babies. Brilliant minds could create world-changing technologies, but to be quirkless was still synonymous with being meek. The only reason David Shield, greatest support item and hero costume designer in the world, and Nobel Prize winner on top of all that, got as many accreditations as he had was because he had a quirk. Had he not had one, it was likely he'd have spent his career being passed over for those only passably brilliant, as long as they themselves possessed even the most minor of quirks, if not having his work stolen outright under the pretense that a quirkless person could never come up with something so brilliant. A depressing thought, to be honest. Doubly so because in my case, the villain that had attacked Takiko in the orphanage had directly damaged the quirk factor, meaning if this body's original quirk was still in there, it no longer had the software necessary to activate it. Suo, barring some sort of quirk factor transplant or something else equally shady, in this country, I was potentially doomed to working in a black company until all the overtime, mental, and physical abuse of an overworked and underpaid manager killed me. At, or all those things caused someone else to go postal, killing everyone in the building with a runaway quirk during a death march when the flesh was spongy and bruised. At least if I didn't play up my tiger hair for everything it was worth. Even heteromorphs with the most vestigial of physical abnormalities were better off than those without any quirk at all. Of course that was a story for another day. Uh-huh, I'm worried about him. Hitomi hummed somberly as she picked at her midday meal. Take Chan. About what? Kamenaga asked. It's about his blood work, she said somberly. What he said happened to him last night sounds like a quirk. But if he's still quirk factor negative, then... Kamenaga simply nodded, since it went without saying what that'd mean for his future. I'm scared. I'm scared of what's going to happen to him, she said turning her gaze out the window. Kids will make fun of you if your quirk is lame, but it's even worse if you don't have one at all. Doubly so if you go to school near a hero academy. Quirkless abuse was allegedly at its absolute worst in Musutafu near the Shizuoka prefecture because of its proximity to Yui. Not like that was something people liked to advertise, given how unheroic it was, especially in the shadow of All Might's alma mater, and given half the juvenile villains that cropped up were hero school rejects who couldn't make the cut but still felt like the world owed them something. Well, there was a reason being a hero, and being altruistic, tended to be mutually exclusive, but didn't take Hiko have one to start with? What was it called? Yes, it was. Itomi hummed, a little embarrassed she'd let that detail about him slip in the past year. However, if he goes back into the public school system, I don't think they'll take him at his word if he says a villain stole my quirk, even though there are guys out there like Eraserhead or Negator that can cancel quirks. Both of them are underground heroes who largely conceal the fine print of their quirks, and even then it's only temporary. What happened to Takiko? Having your quirk outright stolen is the stuff of old wives' tales. If he says that, then, they'll double down and bully him even worse, Kamenaga hummed somberly. Well, how long do the brass need him around for? She questioned, since being quirkless was of less social import the further from elementary school one got. Sure, people without quirks did get passed over for promotions and career advancement in the working world. But that was only in the absolute worst of circumstances. If you were good at your job, and people could recognize that, it stopped mattering whether you had a quirk or not. Contrary to popular belief, it was possible to have a fulfilling life without a quirk. You just had to work for it a little harder, was all. I don't know and I haven't been able to tell him about. About. About with the crazy guy who was carving him up in his sleep. Well, I mean, Dr. Shiga never left any mark so. Hey, at least that creepy ass surgeon can't cut him up now that he's awake, right? Kamenaga asked. Yes, I suppose he can't. Uh-huh. Based on my testimony from the night prior, the possibility existed that what occurred was a visual and auditory hallucination. Gain bramage could still come about from those recovering from comas, especially if the coma was quirk-related. So after lunch while my blood work was being run, Hitomi wheeled me into a room with a large CT scanner. 
a technology that hadn't changed, at least on the exterior, very much since the 21st century. Apparently this model could also do live screenings of neural activity, which became increasingly important as quirks and quirk factors came further into play in the field of medicine. If Dane Bramage could make a quirk run rampant, that shit needed to be locked down pronto. Takeko kun do you have any fillings or piercings we need to worry about? The technician inquired from the adjoining room. Pretty sure I don't, I say picking at my teeth. At the very least, Takeko had stayed abreast of his oral hygiene before switching to an all-liquid diet. Don't worry, he doesn't, Hitomi reassured. Well, if anyone was to know the intricacies of my current body, it would be her. All right, then. If you can just lay down, we can get started. After that, there wasn't much I needed to do other than lay back and let myself be slid into the machine's interior. I'd have tapped my finger on the slab I was laying on. But I didn't want to do anything that'd skew the results. So, can you repeat for me what it is you saw? The technician inquired. Well, I was brushing my teeth. My hand spasmed. Hitomi winced. I dropped my toothbrush. I reached down to grab it, and suddenly, everything just freezes like I hit the pause button on the remote. And the reason you didn't bring this to anyone's attention then? I didn't want to drag anyone out of bed in the middle of the night, I answered. If it wasn't a one-off, it'd be there regardless of when I told anyone about it. If it was a one-off, well... Better I find out in the morning where everyone is amenable from not getting dragged out of bed in the middle of the night. A fair assessment, the man conceded. I don't want to get your hopes up, but it might be possible to possess powers independent of the plus alpha. What? Like ESP or PK? I'm amazed someone your age even knows what that means. Oh, Take-kun is very, very smart. Hitomi said singing my praises. Before I met him, I never knew about the Russians attempting to harness psychic power before paranormality. Something about how during the Cold War when everyone was pointing nukes at each other, the East and the West kept searching for the next big weapon to throw over the Iron Curtain. Though, sounds like Takeko is very knowledgeable, the CT operator conceded. You must really enjoy history. I suppose. I hummed aloud. It wasn't that I was a history buff. I was the farthest thing from. It's just, in the 23rd century where everyone paid attention to nothing but heroes this and heroes that, any special attention paid to the time before paranormality without looking it up from a book or a phone was considered amazing. Almost like everyone forgot there was a world before superpowers. Well, their ignorance is my gain, I suppose. Unfortunately, I don't think my meta-knowledge will do anything about Japanese history. But that's a story for another day. That time-stopping sensation. Do you think you can activate it again? The technician asked. Maybe. If I focus on the memory, I might be able to trigger it again, I say aloud. Unless it's like an attack on Titan where Rin couldn't Titan shift until he had a task in mind. Like that thing with the spoon. Or was it a fork? I'm used to myself. All right then. I'll keep the scanner running for any abnormalities. Although, I won't get my hopes up, I assured him. At the very least, I want to put this thing to bed. Inhaling through my nose and exhaling through my mouth, I emptied my mind, recalling as much of that memory as I could, the sensation, the urgency of wanting to catch my toothbrush before it hit the ground. After a few moments, that foreign rumbling hit me like a quake, that high-pitched whine heralding a sudden vividness of clarity before my eyes, while everything else delineated between red and blue. Uh-huh. H-M-M-M-M-M-M. Hitamu hummed, squinting through her special mono-lens glasses since the monitor's blue light wasn't exactly present, a common issue amongst mono-eyes. I'm not really sure what any of this means. It's understandable. Neuroscience had to rapidly evolve as the plus alpha changed what went on upstairs. The CT technician replied. Emitter quirks, elemental especially, use a lot of processing power, while transformation type rely more on muscle memory. Mutant quirks can radically alter the shape of a brain based on what additional limbs and physical attributes one possesses. In special cases, it'll take two or three experts just to find out what's wrong with a single brain. And is there anything wrong with his? Well, the coma didn't do him any favors, but what I'm really worried about is the damage we can't see. W what's happening? Itomi cried out. His brain's lighting up like a Christmas tree, the CT technician replied. Takiko, are you alright in there? Why yeah, I'm fine. Takiko replied, a hand going up to his forehead. It, it wasn't a full stop this time. More like, slow motion, I guess. You guess, I mean. Unless there's just something wrong with that clock across from the CT machine. Takiko replied. It kinda looked like the second hand got lazy all of a sudden. Hmm, interesting, the technician mused. Think you can do it again. That feeling of an ice pick between my eyes tells me Nuru. Well, at least he isn't putting on airs, Hitamu mused cutely. Uh-huh. So, what's the verdict? I asked. Well, I'd need to pass these findings along to a specialist. But there's definitely something going on up there, the technician mused looking at his monitors. That being said, this ability of yours. I'd hesitate using it too frequently. 
Why so? I asked, seeding toward the opinion of someone infinitely more knowledgeable about the human brain than I speak feeling notwithstanding. I mean, the human brain only takes up 2% of the body's weight, barring deviations caused by the plus alpha. Despite how little mass it takes up in comparison, at standing, the brain consumes 20% of the body's some energy reserves, and you're afraid I might empty my battery. In a sense, the doctor admitted, I'm no expert in ESP, and most PK users are phonies, but this ability in of itself, it could put a tremendous strain on your neural tissue. And that's even if we discount the pre-existing damage. Oops, the technician winced at Hitomi's look. No, no, it's fine. I kinda suspected I was Dane Bramaged. I returned, the two of them blinking at me for some reason. Anyway, it's not like dilated time is actually good for anything unless I can act on it. One such example I can recall is from the second season of that time I got reincarnated as a slime. Like myself, the antagonist Kaioya was someone who had reincarnated from their original world, while his did grant him accelerated perception, 300x normal speed I think. That ability was all but useless against someone who could match if not completely exceed that perception. When Hakuro used his at his opponent's neck, Kaioya had been completely incapable of dodging because while he could see the world around him at 300x speed, he may as well have been standing still, which in context he was given Hakuro's skill with the blade. Thusly, in the end, all that Kaioya's had done for him was give his decapitated head more time to reflect on all the evil he'd until his mind caught up to his body and died. At least we can put this matter to bed, I sighed. Maybe I can use it for test-taking, or something. Mental fatigue aside, that's actually a pretty useful quirk, if you can get a handle on it. The technician hummed, ushering Hitomi and I out. Take, take Hiko-kun. My nurse said to me as soon as we were outside. Oh no, I know that tone. Can I have a word with you? Uh-huh. As it turned out, Hitomi had received the results of my blood work between the end of lunch and my appointment with the CT scanner. As far as I was concerned chemically, I was quirk factor negative. Thus, with the added affirmation that I was likely going to remain quirkless, at least on paper, I decided to redouble my training and my studies. If knowledge was power, then ignorance was weakness, and in a world like this where those without powers were ostracized in a turnabout reversal to the popular trend in fiction. According to Hitomi, Yui was not only one of the greatest hero schools in the world, but its other acclaimed academic courses could equally lead to great things. Even if the general, support, and management courses weren't as glamorous or make you a household name like All Might, Endeavor, Best Genus, and so on, simply graduating from Yui, on any level, opened up more doors than any other high school could provide. Even the most prestigious non-hero-affiliated high school couldn't hope to compare. And the only ones that could were the greatest hero schools in America, Russia, and Europe, who instead of nukes possessed the greatest quantity and quality of quirk-wielding individuals as a deterrent. Turns out China was no longer a world superpower, but that was a story for another day. Itomi herself had graduated from Yui's Class C at the near top of the general course, and as such was able to attend Tokyo University with a full scholarship. While the complete and utter lack of binocular vision due to her mono eye made her ineligible to become a surgeon, she had been able to earn her nursing degree because she simply loved to take care of others. While it was true that anyone with a doctorate could do much the same, she admitted to not having the constitution to actually tell someone they were going to die and that there was nothing to be done about it. And of course, her aversion to blood was yet another deterrent from that career path. Now, in my previous life I only knew about Tokyo Yu from my collection of Love Hina manga. However, that Tokyo Yu had been able to withstand the neo-dark ages and persist into the modern day, made it the ideal choice for a quirkless individual like myself. And given I no longer had the autism debuff, it was actually very possible that I could graduate from top-of-the-line schools and make a fulfilling life for myself, or at least more fulfilling than I had previously been able to attain. Not that there was anything wrong with the life I'd made for myself, though dying definitely had put a stop to any upward mobility I'd been working towards. Of course, unlike the big breaks to be found in Ice Guy stories, if I wanted a successful future in this world, I'd have to actually work for it. There was no god with a capital G to give me a cheat ability out of pity for the way I died, and I hadn't been reincarnated into the scion of an affluent family, rife with socioeconomical opportunity regardless of how many or how few fucks I gave. Being quirkless, it was completely possible I wouldn't be able to achieve any of that, but at the very least I could try. Thus, with Yui in, or Tokyo Yu in my sights on the horizon, I scarfed down my lunch and resumed my studies. You'd be surprised how much study and research one can accomplish when one's brain has dibs on the domestic blood supply. Uh-huh. Later that afternoon, Hitomi sat in with me as I watched yet more old hero TV footage, the accompaniment of violin, cello, trumpet, drums, xylophone, and other instruments for their orchestral score always able to get me pumped. The glitz and glamour of Sternbild only further reinforced my desire to visit the megalopolis someday. 
though to that end, I'd need money to really enjoy any of it. You don't go on vacation to spend all your time in a hotel room, after all. For the time being, watching then live recordings of Hero TV had become my favorite pastimes. On the one hand, I was pretty fucking stoked that the events of Tiger and Bunny were a part of this world's history. The corporate age of heroism always fascinated me due to the deeper layers, like interpersonal politics between heroes who simultaneously competed against and worked with one another. On the other, all the familiar faces had been dead for around a century on the tail end of the corporate age where heroism shifted to the commercial age, which in itself was depressing. Sure, there were museums and monuments dedicated to all the old heroes that Apollon Media, Helios Energy, Helperides Finance, Kronos Foods, Odysseus Communication, Poseidon Line and Titan Industry all sponsored out of the world-famous Justice Tower. But if I'd had any choice in the matter, I'd have wanted to be reincarnated into Sternbold instead. Oh well, at least for the time being I have all this great footage. I beamed with a shit-eating grin as Kotsu unleashed his wild roar in the pursuit of justice. Sure, his more traditional costume of cowl-type mask and cape was considered outdated by today's standards where secret identities were a rarity, and back then it was affectionately referred to as the crap suit by the fans. But Kotsu Kaburagi Aka Wild Tiger represented an ideal of heroism that was in short supply in the modern era. The noble, altruistic spirit of self-sacrifice, a more honest, heroic motivation that I valued above the more or less literal corporate shills that dominated the corporate age. Thanks to my meta-knowledge, I was probably the only person alive who truly knew how much Kotsu had to give up and endure just to stay true to his heroic ideal. Sure, his heroic ideals may have been inspired by the charlatan, Mr. Legend, but Kotsu made that heroic spirit a reality through his own hard work. This is of course assuming all that stuff with Maverick and Auroboros remained unchanged in this timeline. I couldn't exactly go digging for that sort of thing because on the off chance Auroboros was still around. Wait, I mused as Blue Rose used her signature cutie slide to escape gunfire. A cringe-worthy super move if ever there was one. If Tiger and Bunny really happened in this timeline, what about series like Talentless Nana? I pondered, a shudder rolling through me. It wouldn't really surprise me if in the earliest days of paranormality. That world government sequestered quirk users to isolated islands and had them kill one another off Lord of the Flies style. And since the multiverse was no longer theoretical, at least to me, it only made the possibility greater that someone without power could trump those with through skill and deductive reasoning alone. Take-kun, is something wrong? Hitomi asked. I am fine. Just a chill. I returned as her beautiful pink eye regarded me. Sure, she may have been a heteromorph, but to me she was still a good person, and that was what's important, both here and in my old life. To me, it didn't matter if you were white or black or whatever. If you were a good person, I had no problem with you. If you were an asshole, well, it was less that I was racist as I hated all assholes equally. It truly did sicken me that with the sheer diversity of body types, racism still existed, not to mention all that bullshit in the Middle East that was still going on. So, who's your favorite for this season? I asked in the same tone as someone asking about a live season of spectator sports. HMMMMMM. Itomi hummed, tapping her finger on her chin. I think I like Origami Cyclone. His kabuki poses in the background always make me laugh. Yeah, he is kinda funny. I admitted, it wasn't that I disparaged Ivan Carolyn's conduct. Only gave him so much mileage since he didn't possess a copy ability to go with it. It's just, in the context of the corporate age, for the majority of his career, Origami Cyclone was more of a gag character, someone that companies could hire cheaply to sneak their corporate logos into the screenshots of other heroes as they took center stage and posed for the camera. He definitely had his moments of badassery, which only went to show how amazing ordinary humans could still be, independent of their quirks. Of course, it was only an eventuality that such celebrated individuals fell to the wayside. The Olympics going the way of the dodo as televised events like the UUE Sports Festival and its foreign equivalents became the hit broadcasts of each quarter. For me, it's the same as always. Wild Tiger, I said striking a pose in my bed, take Hiko's childlike exuberance shining through to the surface. I blame the juvenile brain housing my consciousness. Yes, I really like him too, Hitomi smiled. You know, he reminds me a lot of All Might. How so? I asked. As far as I knew, All Might was just a more streamlined version of the Hulk with great PR. Sure, he was amazing by this age's standards, but I just couldn't bring myself to find him very interesting. What with how easily he beat all the baddest? I had no problem with the fact that he could save lots of people, but just like with Superman in my old world, I just didn't find god-tier protagonists to be very interesting unless there were even stronger god-tier antagonists to keep challenging them. You'd think a manga where the bulk of the cast was immortal in one way or another would be boring, but Ken Akamatsu proved me wrong on that front, not to mention, that goddamn smile weirded me the fuck out. The only people who smile like that are those with some horrible secret. 
batter a disgusting fetish on their internet search history. I guess it's how he always prioritizes the people over points, Hitomi hummed. Yeah, he'd have been a great hero if he were born in this age, I nodded. Throughout the bulk of Wild Tiger's career, even though he saved so many people with his, he was always in second to last on the Hero TV leaderboards, at least until Barnaby Aka Bunny came onto the scene and the two pooled their resources. Sure, other heroes like Sky High, Blue Rose, and Fire Emblem had a ton of stopping power, but their self-aggrandizing would hardly ingratiate them to the current generation if they were here. Endeavor, I could tell at a glance, was the sort of hero who cared more for the fame that saving people got him than the saving of people themselves. It really was depressing how few heroes like Wild Tiger there were in the present. And sure, this All Might guy was the symbol of peace and all, but there was something unsettling about that smile of his. Not villain in disguise or presidential candidate levels of unsettling, but the genre awareness I carried with me from my old life just gave me a gut feeling there was more to his story. Most heroes would flaunt their quirks whenever they got the chance, if not make their own opportunities to do so unprompted. But for some reason, All Might always seemed to deflect when that line of questioning came up. The guy had been a licensed hero for more than three decades, and people still didn't know what his quirk was. That line of thought was cut short as Wild Tiger's eagerness to save the day necessitated a premature interruption in the usual 30-second commercial break Hero TV tried to squeeze in between lulls in the action. Maybe it wasn't healthy, escaping from the present by obsessing with the heroes of the corporate age, but it was still my decision to make. A notice to my recent and long-time readers, I finally got around to creating a Discord account. At first it was just for some one-on-one -on -one chats with some friends and acquaintances, but I decided to experiment with a server of my own to open up for story-related discussions for my Teen Titans, RWBY, Young Justice, Legend of Korra, and My Hero Academia fanfics. Reviews on this site of course are still encouraged, but the Discord account is simply to offer a wider ground for discussion amongst my reader base. If you want to friend me on Discord, here's my profile name, New Mystery 356-9039. I'm curious to see if I'll have any takers, so until then, on to the fanmail section. The uh huh, Grey Falcon Knight. So wait I'm a little confused. The MC has temporal manipulation but is unable to move while it occurs. Is that what you mean? Pause with the whole heightened perception but being unable to move fast enough to dodge something. Wouldn't that mean he just has heightened perception like the sharing it? Bree, yes and no. There's more nuance to it than that. Super Pierce. So overall one of the big reasons people look down the on quirkless individuals is because they're afraid they allow other quirkless to take higher positions in the world. Re, I feel like reason is too strong a word. It's basically the quote, unquote justification that people have to be racist or sexist or whatever is to one another, because people need very little reason to be assholes to one another. The way I see it, quirkless discrimination in the world of my hero academia is basically racism with extra steps. If quirks didn't exist, Bakugu would be discriminated against because he's a delinquent with foreign ancestry, and Izuku would be the hot commodity. Mitternacht. Maybe that time dilation is his form of giving him time to equip weapons. Maybe little Takeo will create some ratchet and clank weapons and armors. Re, huh, that's an interesting way of looking at it. Lomi coffee, hmm, you're not the first to call the toe joint thing out and you won't be the last. I mean, a toe joint. Still, it is interesting that the body is reacting like this. Friggin' knowledge and I love it. Also Tiger and Bunny for the win. Re, yeah, Tiger and Bunny is still one of my favorite superhero media. Sultan Issel Arslan, finally someone calls that smile out. I don't know how many times I had to stop myself from punching the screen because of how annoying it was in this manga. Re, someone from the 21st century who didn't grow up in a world of superheroes would naturally be distrustful of a smile like that in a world of superheroes. Just look at guys like Hyperion or Homelander and you'll see what I mean. Uh huh. In my previous life, outside my autism, I was completely ordinary. I wasn't especially strong or handsome or sociable nor overtly successful with the opposite gender. Just your average run-of-the-mill guy you could find anywhere. Someone who keeps their head down and not drawing attention to themselves. With how infrequently I could even use my, a reference to the outer world since this and that looked almost exactly the same. I suppose it only made sense to count myself among the unfortunate few born without power, in a world where people wanted it since they could think. Sure, I could say that was what my quirk was, but I'd seen a similar ploy royally backfire in Iris Hunter, so I decided it was easier to be upfront with my quirklessness, bite the bullet instead of keeping up an impossible facade. After all, it'd be too easy for a close associate to slip up for someone with a quirk copying or quirk appraising ability to oust me. And even if I could keep up the lie, it'd only sour any relationship I might make with a girl in the far-off future. Not that I'd actually want to use a quirk even if I did have one, other than it being troopy as hell for the Ice Guy subgenre where the MC wakes up with a cheat ability. A minor quirk if nothing else would've at the least made my life a bit easier. 
Sure, hero was the go-to occupation that everyone with a pulse wanted to be when they grew up. But there were those with hero-grade quirks who by their own volition would rather live an ordinary life. Oh well, no use crying over spilled milk. I experimented with my over the next few days, and discovered that my ZAWARUDO episode was a one-off, as I'd not been able to replicate the feat since. Instead, it seemed to be a 1-60 dilation of time as I perceive it, where I can stretch an entire second real time into a full minute imaginary time. Not that I could measure it exactly. Counting to 60 in your head isn't exactly something you can set your clock to. In fact, counting was about as precise as eyeballing a bubble in a tube of water, other than the fact that my movement isn't accelerated. And all my does is give me more time to think if I'm in a bind. The cooldown between each use sucks eggs. After my first test run, using the memory of the falling toothbrush as my psychosomatic trigger, I discovered that my brain would send me a little warning before my cooldown period had ended in the form of a little twinge of pain between my eyes. The equivalent of an ability icon flashing red as it were. Trying to force my into action gave me the mother of all migraines. So I eventually found out that my cooldown was around 8 hours. With 24 in a day. And at the very most, I'd be able to use my three times without making my brain feel like it were melting. Nah, I've that cooldown and our duration would shrink, grow respectively as I got older and or used it more. But in all honesty, it seemed like a really useless power not worth the pain of leveling up. I mean sure, half the Ice Guy subgenre is about taking crappy powers that everyone writes off as useless and making them okay I know it's rich coming from me, but your powers are bullshit. But really, if I wanted to help people, I could become a cop or a doctor. And if this body happened to be a closet adrenaline junkie maybe I could become a firefighter. As it stood right now, I had no idea what I wanted to do with my second life. I had no idea what this body's limits would be when it was grown. Nor did I know how many of Takehiko's original memories would float back to the surface and influence my decision making. As much as it sucked, I was starting life over again from that of a pre-teen, so I decided to do what came naturally, live my life, take my time because that was all I could do. If I had to explain it to another person, the whole reincarnation thing to me would have been like replaying a favorite video game years after you'd beaten it the first time, only it didn't have new game plus. Sure, you knew where all the treasure chests were, the invincibility frames of your super moves, and even how to beat the final boss with some obscure key item. But without the stat bonuses that came with new game plus, all you could really do was slog through it from level 1 all the way to the level cap like the first time you played the game. I mean sure, even if people accepted I was a late 20-something in a prepubescent body and didn't burn me at the stake for it like the Catholic Church did to Joan of Arc or Pope Joan Aka Johanna, there's no way anyone would entrust Takeko with adult responsibilities. But hey, all that was still years and years away. For the time being, I chose to focus on what I could do right now. Get well and get out of the hospital. Tomorrow's problems for tomorrow's me. Uh-huh, something both disturbing and wildly offensive I discovered today was that as a parallel to people being told in my time that drinking bleach cured autism, apparently in this timeline. Drinking bleach, for whatever reason, is not only accredited with curing quirklessness, but is still being used as a quote-unquote life hack to cure autism. I mean, honestly, you'd think after two centuries with so many advancements in medicine, neurology, and all the other ologies, that people would have wisened up to the fact that drinking bleach is B-A-A-A-A-D. Then again, to quote Agent K from the original Men in Black, a person is smart, people are dumb, panicky, dangerous animals. I guess even in a world filled with superpowers, superheroes, supervillains, and everything in between, some things just don't change. You'd think with meta-abilities rising to prominence that there'd have been some sort of spiritual awakening, renaissance, something that would naturally make people worldwide better versions of themselves. But no, people are still the same self-centered, self-destructive assholes they were in my time. Honestly, two centuries and people still think chugging bleach like a fish does water is a good idea. What the hell, humanity? What the actual hell? Well, at least people are smart enough in this century not to believe that chewing on cyanide stops tooth decay. I stand corrected. Uh-huh, Takekun, what are you doing today? Itomi asked cheerfully. Oh, you know, losing all faith in humanity. Huh, nothing, never mind, I say putting the tablet down. So, what's new with you? My family's coming by to celebrate you waking up. She smiled happily. Unfortunately, I can't bring them up here to see you, Suo. That's okay. It's the thought that counts. I wave off. Maybe, but I hope you can meet them someday. You're just around my sister's age and it couldn't hurt for her to make another friend. The Cyclopean nurse hummed. I'll worry about friends as soon as I'm well enough to leave. I hum back. The corner of Hitomi's mouth jerked nervously. But in a hospital on the face of a nurse, that could mean just about anything, really. Or at least I assumed. In my previous life, I was fit enough to have never had lengthy hospital stays, so I could have easily been misreading my nurse's expression. 
Then again, no nurse back home would have been cycloptic to this degree. It might not be in person. But let me introduce you, Hitomi hummed, pulling up her phone. Uh-huh. The pictures hadn't been completely up to date. But thanks to Hitomi I was able to get a pretty good idea of what her family was like. Her father, Kuma, was a bespectacled bear of a man literally instead of metaphorically. Basically, his heteromorphic quirk made him resemble a large humanoid bear with black fur and a pale muzzle. Hitomi's mother, apart from having two eyes, looked almost exactly like her but with a slightly smaller chest. Her little sister, Mitsumi similarly took after their mother, the difference being instead of one eye like Hitomi, she had three, the third being on her forehead, but she was undeniably cute. Lastly was her younger brother Fumio, who like his mother looked perfectly ordinary, with an ordinary number of eyes I could still see through his long bangs. So suffice it to say, the children of the Hitomi family lean more towards their mother's side of the gene pool than the father's. Of course, a minute later I found out her mother had passed away while she was in high school. That of course, on top of my apparent age, would have made it really awkward to tell her how cute she looks with her hair up. After a little more physical therapy, Hitomi took her leave of me and I went back to my own studies. Normally that'd be where my evening bled into all the others, but this time was different. In the evenings, this floor of whatever building I'd been in had always been quiet, but this time, it was almost eerily quiet. The hall lights completely out. It was probably paranoid as hell to lock the door to my room, but despite doing so anyway, well into the evening, someone turned the lock with a key, and the atmosphere that leached into the room would have caused ominous music to play were this a light novel type game. W who is it? I found my voice stuttering as a tall figure peeled away from the darkness in the hallway. Oh, you're still awake I see, the man said sounding almost disappointed. Well, you can call me Dr. Kayushiga, is what the western-oriented part of my brain told me. What came out of his mouth was Dr. Shiga, Kayu. I'm the doctor who's been looking after you the past year. Ah, well, it's nice to meet you. I returned, the hairs on my neck standing on end as I appraised the guy. If I didn't know about quirks, I would have immediately thought this Dr. Shiga was some kind of undead. Ash-colored skin, prominent cheekbones, ominous eyes, pointed nails and ears, all the hallmarks of a western vampire. And not the shitty twilight variety either. The only normal thing about him was the shoulder-length black hair. Which reminds me, I really need to apologize to that guy I screamed werewolf at. So, you mind telling me why you're here? Oh, I just need to give you a vaccination. Right, because that isn't ominous at all. I think Hitomi would have told me if I needed another shot. Yes, well, unfortunately Nurse Hitomi can be a bit of a spaz. Not arguing with you there, but I know my rights. Kinda. I can refuse at any time I want. Yeah. <laughs> Why'd you have to wake up so willful? Dr. Shiga asked as he withdrew a syringe filled with ominous blue fluid from his coat. Ah, and that's my cue. I do not. C-O-N-S-E-E-N-T. I screamed grabbing everything within arm's reach and chucking them at the vampire-like doctor. The man blocking his face with his arms before one object struck his hand sending the syringe to the floor. My tablet catching him in the groin a moment later. W-O-O-P-W-O-O-P-W-O-O-P-W-O-O-P-W-O-O-P-W-O-O-P-W-O-O-P. I whoop at as I ran past the doubled over doctor. H-E-A-L-P. H-E-A-L-P. My panic screams sound way more masculine in my head. At present, it was nothing but high notes. Shit, 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 shit. What is it with this body and villains? I cried as I ran for my life. The hallway eerily dark and bereft of other people. I knew the stairs. Gotta get to the stairs. If I could just get to the stairs, I. Click 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 click. Ow. FWTT. AGH. I cried as something stuck me in the back. Pulling the needle-tipped object from my back, my stomach sank as I saw the tiny cylindrical dart in my palm. I'd played enough video games to know what it was. Fuuk. Wump. The uh huh. Elsewhere. One chan. One chan. What's take Hiko chan like? Mitsumi asked cutely. Three eyes open and innocent. Off to the side. Hitomi's father sighed while cleaning his glasses, lamenting that his son wasn't in attendance as well. Oh, well, he's very hard-working. Really good with English, Hitomi replied with the smile of a proud mother. Honestly, he speaks better English than I do most of the time. Whenever we watch old Hero TV episodes together, I need him to translate half the time. Hero TV. She blinked. Oh yes, way, way back. Heroes used to wear corporate logos and pause for commercial breaks during the chase, Hitomi began. Really? Mitsumi blinked cutely, trying to imagine what that was like. Ramen's up. The family joint's waiter announced expertly balancing three large bowls of ramen in his arms. One chan, did you remember your goggles? Mitsumi asked cutely. Yep, I see her did. Itomi grinned as she withdrew her Detnerette brand anti-hot broth and fogging goggles from her purse and put them over her eye. At the sight of this Kuma let out a good-natured sigh. 
Sure, it was a bit frivolous buying a Detonarette brand lifestyle support item just to stop hot broth from getting in her eye. But it was her own money and she was a grown woman. Uh-huh. Well, she it. I thought as I came to. Strapped down to an operating table in nothing but my boxers. A large Y drawn on my chest and marker. So, this is how I die. Again. Ho, you're awake sooner than anticipated Dr. Shiga hummed idly as he adjusted his tools. Everything beyond the overhead spotlight shrouded in darkness. Do I really have to be awake for this? Hey, if I'm going to die horribly, I might as well be as sarcastic as I damn well please. And on the off chance I can stall long enough for some janitor with laser eyes or something to wander by, well, crazier has happened in comic book worlds. Then again, this body's got shit luck, Sue. Part of me wants to sedate you. But it's so hard to get data from a sleeping subject. Dr. Shiga mused idly as he stroked his chin. Holy crap it's actually working. Uh-huh. Holy crap. He's gonna get dissected. Only if he's euthanized first. If he's still alive when it happens, it falls under the category of vivisection. How can you be so calm about this? Sigmund demanded as Clank continued to watch the dual feeds of Nurse Hitomi with her family and take Hiko on the operating table, each with separate timestamps from their sanctum within the great clock. This was supposed to be his second chance. Why aren't you doing anything? You know, they have an old saying amongst humans. Ratchet hummed as he adjusted his grip on his chronoscepter, wielding it like a pool cue, his eyes locked on Hitomi's screen. Less is more. Uh-huh. Crack. Ock. Hitomi cried as a crack suddenly ran up the side of her teacup. One san, are you okay? Mitsumi asked. The eye on her forehead closed. I have a bad feeling. Hitomi suddenly said, her eye darting before she grabbed her purse and got to her feet. I'm sorry, but I need to go. Wait, Kuma hummed. Aru-san, don't try to stop me. I'm not, he said rising from his seat as well. I'm going with you, Aru-san, Hitomi said smiling sweetly. I'm going too, Mitsumi said. Her third eye narrowed and her arms crossed. When you're like this, we couldn't stop you even if we wanted to. Uh-huh, I wish I wasn't awake for this. I'm not a big fan of mad scientists. Stole, 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 mad, Dr. Shiga groused. HM, yes, I guess I am a little mad, but not without reason. I have my reasons, he assured himself, hands trembling. Lunatics tend to justify why they're lunatics. It's called paranoia. Huh, being this lippy is kind of fun. Hope I live long enough to enjoy it. I am scared, but my fear of trumps is very justified. Trumps. I hummed testing the word on my lips in the proper tense. Given how obsessed everyone in this world is with superpowers, I'll rightfully assume he's talking about quirks that directly affect other quirks, like Rogue's mutant power from the X-Men franchise. One who controls the powers of others become controlled by their power. They steal quirks from others to increase their power. I used to work for a Trump, you know, until he let the experiment of his pet scientist take my quirk. I would have died if he hadn't given my quirk back after his experiment failed. So much pain, the feeling of weakness, the violation. Stole, 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 stole. So a mad scientist was nearly killed by the experiment of another mad scientist. Oh the irony. I don't need your comments. What I want is protection. I want to block the powers of Trumps and you are going to give me my answers. He raged. We all shit. Guess that Lipinus kinda backfired. If I had some duct tape I'd seal that mouth of yours shut, but I guess we're all making concessions today. Stole, 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 stole. You won't get away with this. Oh my god, really. You won't get away with this. That tired old line. Damn it, brain. Get your shit together. Oh, I very much think I will. Dr. Shiga hummed as he eyed a wicked looking scalpel. People nowadays rubberneck around villain attacks when they should be running. Yet they run for the hills over something as insignificant as a little fumigation scare. Oh the irony. Well, at least I know how he cleared the building, apparently. Also, damn it Ireland 180 like this. Bang. G-R-O-A-A-A-A-W-R-R-R. What? Dr. Shiger raged as the door suddenly exploded inward. An enormous, literal bear of a man in a button-up shirt and creased pants shouldered through the barred door like it were plyboard. Take kun Itomi cried coming in from behind him, big fat tears dribbling down her face. Hi, Itomi. I found myself crying, hope swelling in my chest cavity. All right, buddy. The literal bear of a man growled as he pocketed his spectacles, cracking his huge knuckles and rolling his shoulders. Hands off Manaka's patient. And maybe I won't maul you to death, he snarled as his lips drew back revealing ivory fangs. You fools. His blood could save all of us, but only if you let me do my work. Dr. Shiga growled moving to the opposite side of the operating table, interposing himself between Hitomi's father and myself. Not going to happen. Kuma growled as he stepped forward, the implements on the nearby tray rattling as he leaned into his girth. Fine, you leave me no choice then. Dr. Shiga growled as he withdrew a syringe of purple fluid from his coat and jabbed it into his own neck. Super steroids. Crap. I swore as the mad doctor's veins began to bulge, his ash-colored skin paling to a shade like ivory. 
Bones crackled and popped as he grew in height, his muscles beginning to bulge, as his clothes began to tear. His ears became more prominently pointed, and his eyes bled to a pure scarlet, a jet black tongue licking at his lengthening fangs. The final change made by his transformation was that his once black hair bleached to a shade of platinum and grew down his back. Kuma grappling with the mad scientist in a deafening WHUMP of two muscular bodies colliding. As the two of them roared at one another with furious expressions, Hitomi and her little sister rushed into the room and why the hell'd they bring a little girl here? Don't worry, we'll get you out of there. Hitomi cried with something between a smile and a panicked expression on her face as she frantically worked the leather straps on my right, Mitsumi working the ones on my left. Forget about me. Call the police. Get. Crash. Huh. Mitsumi blinked looking over her shoulder, her face paling and two of her three eyes going wide as she spotted Dr. Shiga post throw, the top half of her father's body through the nearby wall. Oh Otu-san. Crap. I swore as the mad doctor rounded on us, that lolling black tongue giving him an even more vampiric look. Dee Dee. Dee 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 don't come any closer. Itomi stuttered with arms spread out, shielding Mitsumi and I with her body. I I I won't let you hurt him. You're going too far. Hey asshole. Mitsumi growled, her top eye leering at the man doctor. Keep your damn hands. Off my sister's patient. Ho, quirk dependent personality disorder. How rare Dr. Shiga purred as his eyes roved over her prepubescent frame. Damn it, this is not good. I shuddered as I eyed Hitomi's father through the hole in the wall. Kuma's down for the count, and he was the only heavy hitter we've got. Everyone else is out for the night, so I've got only one choice left. Tactical time dilation. Damn it, I've got no choice. I thought as I came down and time moved again. Mitsumi, huh? She blinked, this time with all three eyes. Listen, I need you to douse me with that ethanol from the cabinet and then light me on fire. While that mad doctor's trying to save his precious research material, you and your sister make a run for it. It's the only chance you have. It wasn't that I was unheroic in my past life, per se, it's just that I was never put in a position to show that trade off. So either I was always this self sacrificing and was just lacking for opportunity, or maybe this was Takeko talking and I just couldn't tell the difference with my terror addled brain. Don't you dare, Dr. Shiga growled, though he stopped just short. Damn it, he heard me. Stupid vampire ears. No, Takiko. I I won't let you sacrifice yourself. Itomi whimpered looking over her shoulder. Itomi, it's fine. As long as you're safe, I don't care what happens to me. I said trying and failing to hold back the tears in my eyes. Best and, or worst case, I just reincarnate into another world. Oh well, this life was nice while it lasted. Someone your age shouldn't have to sacrifice themselves. For an adult. Oh Otu-san. Hitomi cried as her father dragged himself from the wall, blood matting his muzzle from his forehead and the glasses in his pocket utterly ruined. I might not be a hero, but I have my pride as a father, god damn it. Kuma growled furiously, his own muscles straining against his non-threatening attire. You simpering fools. You just never learn. Dr. Shiga growled as he lunged at Kuma with a scalpel and slashed at him, blood matting the man's fur as Kuma shielded his vitals with his forearms. And no. Stop this. Stop hurting him. Hitomi whimpered as the two men continued to grapple, claw, and slash at one another. At the sight of the two of them fighting tooth and nail like wild animals going for the jugular, her body broke out into a cold sweat as she trembled like a leaf. Crap, this just went from bad to worse. I thought to myself as Hitomi completely froze up, her sister having no luck with the restraints either. Mitsumi, the ethanol, while he's distracted, I whispered as the fighting intensified. Even though the floor was getting stained with both their blood and medical equipment was flying every which way. It was obvious Dr. Shiga had the advantage. Whatever Venom expi bullshit he dosed himself with was no joke. No, I. I won't let anyone else get hurt. Oh, one sin. Mitsumi blinked as the space in front of her sister began to shine a crystalline shade of pink, particles of light visibly gathering into her eye even as she shook like a leaf. Wait, hold on. I blinked as Hitomi shakily put her index and middle fingertips to her temples. Is this awakening? A phenomenon following initial quirk manifestation where, through the experience of intense feelings of stress like that of a life or death situation, a person's quirk is able to evolve on the spot, gaining a new level of strength and or new aspects to its nature than were physically thought possible. Sure, it sounded like the same sort of horseshit you'd find in every shounen battle manga ever, but scientifically it made sense in a world of superpowers for enough physical and or psychological duress to cause a meta-ability to grow in power as a defense mechanism. Treating quirks and their development like overcompensation in the muscular system instead of magic, it felt a lot less deus ex machina Y. So here's hoping Hitomi can actually hit this guy with whatever she's got cooking. What? Dr. Shiga hissed as he shielded his eyes, the light from the nurse's eye intensifying. Ultimate move, pure cure. Lovely, C-Y-C-L-O-O-N-E. 
Hitomi cried leaning forward. A blinding beam of prismatic light firing from her mono eye and catching Dr. Shiga head on, a deafening boom. And a cloud of dust kicked up as the room shook, Mitsumi shielding her eyes with my prone body while Kuma threw himself to the ground. Uh huh, elsewhile. Damn, what a waste of time. The number three pro hero in Japan. The wing hero, Hawks, said to himself as he flew over the Kasumigeski district in Chiyoda Special Ward, Tokyo. That tip was a big fat bust. So either the lead was faked, or someone inside the HPSC leaked that I would be there. Honestly, the number three hero was nostalgic for the days when his reputation was almost non-existent. Back then, no one would have cared if rumors of an up-and-comer being around a certain place at a certain time trickled down the grapevine. But now, with him being so close in rank and ability to the number two, the flame hero, Endeavor, criminals of all stripes would head for the hills whenever they caught even a whiff of him. Oh well, maybe I'll grab some ramen on the way home, he thought to himself as he avoided some nearby birds. Q. Well, what the fucking hell? Hawks yelped as a prismatic beam of light almost nicked the front of his visor, his super acute eyes tracing the path of the beam by the lingering light particles in the night sky. Half an instant later he found the origin to be from within one of the HPSCHQ's hospital wings. The lights were all out so to anyone else it would have looked like everyone had gone home for the night. But it was exactly when a building like that was vacant that trouble reared its ugly head. S-I-I-I-G-H so much for my free time. Hawk sighed before schooling his features and shooting off towards the site of the conflict. Uh-huh. Iwa-a-sugoi-i Mitsumi cooed after poking her head over my prone body. Her three eyes wide with childlike adulation. You're lucky I was willing to immolate myself a second ago. Otherwise I'd be a lot more pissed. Thought I to myself as Hitomi's little sister stopped using my prone body as cover. Then again, my mind went as a little preoccupied by the fact that one of Hitomi's chuny moments came out like word vomit, and that it actually paid off. Still, it seemed to work if all the dust was oh god damn it. Oh what the shit, Mitsumi growled, leering into the clearing smoke with her third eye as Dr. Shiga staggered forward. Most of his right deltoid muscle had been burned away, as well as most of his upper arm and shoulder, the limb completely useless as copious amounts of blood poured out of the injury, other than that he looked perfectly fine. Must have been whatever uppers or some shit was in that concoction he'd taken that let him out wrestle a bear. And to make matters worse, my, my eye, I can't see. Itomi cried pawing at the ground like a certain turtleneck wearing redhead paranormal investigator bereft of her corrective lensing. Damn it, universe, make up your mind. Do you want me to live or not? No wait, this could still work out. That laser blast had to have done some damage to him, so if Kuma plays his cards right. Crash. Yeah, like that. I blinked as Kuma got his second wind and caught Dr. Shiga in the side with a thrown vital sign monitor. By the sound of it and how far Dr. Shiga flew, it must have been like getting hit by a small car or maybe a motorcycle. Damn it, Hitomi. Get up. I can't get these restraints off myself. Right, that's still a problem. I thought as Mitsumi leered at her sister with her third eye while struggling with my restraints. She really must have had multiple personality disorder. You, always getting in my way. Dr. Shiga growled, his right arm hanging limply as he forced himself to his feet, bloodshot eyes absolutely glowering at Hitomi. I won't stand for this. That's quite enough. The next moment, crimson feathers shot out of the darkness from around the corner like things alive and pinned the mad scientist to the floor by his clothes. Before Dr. Shiga could push himself up, Hitomi's father leapt forward and dove at the mad doctor with a slam master's grade body splash, flattening the mad doctor to the floor with a powerful WHUMP that shook the building. Thank you, Hero X Machina. I thought as a guy dressed so ostentatiously he could only be a hero came around the corner. It was kind of dark so I couldn't get a clear look at him, but with those big red wings sticking out of his back and that visor over his eyes, he could only be the number three hero, Hawks. All Might and Endeavor were kind of boring since their power sets were so common in fiction, so it was actually quite a treat getting to see Hawks in action. So, anyone want to tell me what I missed? The number three hero asked dying of the prepubescent child on the operating table. Be the mono-eyed woman fumbling around blindly like she'd lost a contact lens. See the bear-shaped hole in the wall. And, or D the villain whose legs were flailing out from under the man who'd made a aforementioned bear-shaped hole in the wall. Between Hawk's top-notch quirk and Kuma flattening my would-be vivisector to the floor, I finally felt like this harrowing ordeal was behind me. Uh-huh. Thankfully, Hitomi got her vision back after a couple minutes of scurrying about under her sister's watchful eye. Since Hitomi's mono eye wasn't connected to a pure energy dimension like Scott Summers, Cyclops were, I had no way of knowing the exact mechanics of how her laser eye worked. Of course, I imagined it wasn't something she could whip out whenever she felt like it if the Velma Dinkley she pulled after using her pure cure lovely cyclone was any indicator. 
between getting his arm practically seared off and having a full-grown bear flatten him to the floor. There really wasn't much left for the cops to do when they arrived other than scraping what was left of Dr. Shiga off the floor and fit him inside a villain-grade restraining jacket like someone stuffing a meat pie. Of course it probably helped that whatever super drug he was on had worn off, which actually worsened the effect having a full-grown bear, man body splash would have. Quirk restriction laws, I would later learn, only directly affected emitter and transformation types. For heteromorph, mutant type quirks, there was a lot more of a gray area surrounding them because you couldn't just find a person for being taller, or stronger, or simply looking different than someone else. As such, Hitomi's dad didn't get in any trouble for using his bear-like strength on another person, since technically it counted as the right of self-defense. That in of itself had been iffy for a long time at the start of paranormality when countless KKK and Third Reich knockoffs were running around on their freak hunts. But all it took was enough upstanding politicians swapping the word ability user with words like black, Jew, Chinese, and so on to finally get people to accept the fact that beneath the meta ability, people were ultimately still people. Real shocker. Of course in my opinion. It was probably that meta-discrimination being spun into racial discrimination simply made it too difficult for politicians beholden to their constituents to keep their jobs if they did anything but support the paranormal populace, which enveloped all races. Of course after the quirk saturation threshold passed the 50% marker, it was all over for the non-powered individual in politics and it basically became a dog and pony show with a side order of professional mudslinging. Ah, wait, nothing's actually changed, then, back to the present. It felt quite good to get out of those restraints, and I won't pretend that the first thing I did wasn't to run out of that room as fast as my legs could carry me. Nor am I toxically masculine enough to pretend I didn't bawl my eyes out as soon as Hitomi found her way over to me. Since I'd never been in a life-or-death situation like that in my past life, I had no way of knowing if this was me crying, or Takehiko crying and I was just along for the ride. Takehiku sob I'm so glad you're okay. Hitomi sobbed loudly as she held me to her bosom, big fat tears matting my hair to my skull. I chose to ignore the little girl my own age leering at me with her third eye, though the fact that I was being smothered in a marshmallow hell probably helped. How, did you know to find me? I asked, jockeying for air. Well, a little while ago, my teacup broke, and I had a really bad feeling, so I just went with my gut and ran over as fast as my legs could carry me. She said in a relieved tone, though the way she was squeezing me hinted she might have been putting on a brave face. Thank you, for coming back for me. No need to thank me. After all, you're my number one patient. She grinned finally letting me come up for air. Ha, huh, I'm, ha ha, your only patient. I muttered weakly as all the adrenaline I'd been swimming in finally ran out, and blackness creeped around my vision. I'm just, gonna pass out. Now, boing, tomorrow's problem for tomorrow's me. Super Pierce, since you used the term Trump for a quirk user who can do things like copy power or erase them I assume you will be using the worm power classification. Ignoring the slight confusion with Breaker and Changer Powers its pretty well-established power system ignoring the PRT threat rating. Re, not as such. Any knowledge of Worm I have is second-hand, and I don't write stuff into stories I can't write about faithfully. It's why you'll never see me write for stuff like Game of Thrones or some other random franchise I know nothing about. I could try, look up stuff on the wiki to brush up on it, but since I'm not impassioned about it, the lack of enthusiasm would show in my work. Mountain Books Age 25 Oh, uh, MC didn't get his hero moment. Now time to wait for a long time again for the next. Or maybe that's just for the other fix. Re. And just what kind of hero moment would an 11-year-old with a functionally useless power have against a nutball like that? Just because you reincarnate into another world doesn't mean you're entitled to anything. The darker, satirical trend of Ice Guy manga are evidence of that. As for the update time. Well, I am trying to keep everything in rotation instead of letting one work or another sit on the back burner for an entire, literal, year. Lomi Coffee. Good to know the current limits of power for him. Oh god damn it. Now I'm thinking about that stupid Tide Pod nonsense. Glad you're including more Hitomi Sensei characters. Hmm. To be fair the guy's name immediately made me think he was connected to all for one. I can understand why he's reacting like that. I'd be paranoid and fearful of a repeat of that. I'm just loving Hitomi's family. In Hawk shows. I quite love his power set and I feel for him, seeing his background. I still feel sadness that Twice had to die simply due to his potential danger. Re, it's functionally useless, but yes, the seas has its limits, as well as a lack of motivation to attempt quirk reinforcement since, without any sub-powers like or any idea of how superhuman humans can get without their quirks, why would he be motivated to? As for the Tide Pod thing, I can totally see people still being stupid enough, 200 years in the future, to do shit like that. 
unless stupid people all die out in the future because of aforementioned stupidity like the Darwin Awards. Yeah, I started reading Nurse Hitomi's Monster Infirmary just before writing this story, and she and all the other characters just seem like such a good fit for the world of My Hero Academia. And yeah, compared to All Might and Endeavors, Hawk's quirk is actually interesting because it isn't one of those dime and a dozen powers like Super Everything and Super Fire. For twice, hey, the guy was an S-class criminal, and Hawks did try to convert him as I recall. Honestly, I feel like if Jin Bubegawara had just been instilled with a sense of work ethic when he was younger, none of that bad shit would have happened to him. It all started going downhill for him when his quirk started using him, instead of the other way around. I mean, sure, in Naruto when aforementioned characters went on strike it was played up for laughs, but when your own doppelgangers turn on you, something is seriously wrong with how you're using your power. The whole am I a clone, existential crisis clone saga nonsense, probably didn't help matters either. Uh huh, good news, I managed to make it through last night's little episode, physically unscathed. Bad news, last night's little episode disturbed enough silt into Keiko's brain that now I was starting to suffer from his past trauma, losing his parents to a villain attack. Getting attacked by another villain in an orphanage a year later, getting attacked by yet another the year after that. Honestly, I'd hate to see the kid that isn't rattled by shit like that. As it stood however, even though it wasn't explicitly my trauma, the fact remained that all of Takehiko's past incidents were starting to hurt me as badly as if they were my own traumas. This could probably be taken as a sign that I was settling into this new body, though thankfully my past memories weren't being overwritten, a fate worse than death in certain cases. Back to the matter at hand. While I was technically only present for the most recent of traumas, that I'd been able to seriously consider self-immolation so that H. Itomi and her family could get away from a botched and hastily planned rescue attempt, it was probably an indicator of how cracked I was. I thought that with my adult mind, I'd be able to get over this incident, put it all behind me. As it turned out, I could not. At least, not without a lot of therapy from an accredited psychiatrist specializing in PBSD, otherwise known as post-villain stress disorder. It's somewhat telling that this world is so obsessed with cops versus robbers I mean, heroes versus villains, that they'd even make a designation like PVSD instead of lumping it in with the pre-existing PTSD like any sane person would. Uh-huh. It was also somewhat telling that I woke up screaming the following morning. As one would expect, the previous night I had recurring nightmares about myself in various forms of vivisection, and that shit followed me into my waking hours. What sucked about it even more was that Hitomi had been waking up alongside me all night to serenade me back to sleep with one of her mother's lullabies whenever I had a fit of night terrors, to the point that in the morning she didn't have a bag under her eye, she had a whole handbag under her eye. That and every time the officers stationed outside my room kicked the door and whenever I started screaming bloody murder, Hitomi nearly had a heart attack. I mean sure, I couldn't exactly control how my trauma-addled mind affected those around me, but it really sucked that I had to drag such a nice woman into my own brand of suffering. No, no, it's okay. It's a nurse's job to look after her patient. Don't worry about me, you just focus on getting well. She'd always tell me in that sweet, motherly voice. She was so angelic, too pure for this world, that it utterly disgusted me to find out she was still single. Why and, or how do I know she doesn't want to stay single? Let's just say her mono eye is really expressive whenever married couples or married couple adjacent topics come up on TV, and leave it at that. I'm really sorry. There, there. You have nothing to be sorry for Hitomi said sweetly stroking my hair, even as hers stuck out in all directions. I don't really know what possessed me to do what I did next, or even in what language, but a moment later the lyrics for Silent Night spilled out of my mouth like word vomit and I started to serenade her to sleep. I don't know if Takehiko was a naturally gifted singer or if Hitomi was just dead tired from looking after me all night, but three quarters of the way through Hitomi laid her head down on the pillow I laid out for her, and she was out like a light. I wasn't completely sure if it was something my mother sung to me or if it was something from Takehiko's memories, but at the very least it did the trick. Hitomi really was too good for this world. Uh-huh. Now, I don't know how word of my incident spread or who all was told or even how much was allowed to be told, but Kamenaga was nice enough to come in and pamper me even though there was nothing wrong with my hair, nor was Hitomi present to fondle. Really, you didn't have to do this for me, is what the adult in me said when presented with a so much sugar you'll get diabetes just from looking at its strawberry shortcake in a neat confectionery box. Not that it would stop the kid I was in from eating a four-mentioned cake. Nonsense. After everything you've been through, you deserve more than that yucky hospital food. Kamenaga replied fervently. Cheeks puffed out cutely. You do make a good argument. I conceded as I looked back into the box. Seriously. This looked like the sort of thing Urza Scarlet would commit homicide over. Well, more so than in the canon at least. MMMMMM. Sugoi AI. The child I was in blurted out, eyes twinkling as it hit my taste buds. I thought you'd like it what child your age doesn't like cake. 
At least she didn't bring me American fast food. After putting that slurry into my original body for close to three decades, I wasn't exactly eager to put any of that chemical-laced crap into this body. There's no telling what went into it now. Cake on the other hand was an exception, and it seemed like Kaminaga thought much the same, because she had one for herself as well. It'd have been rude of me to bring up that her portion was bigger than mine, so I wisely chose not to. Kaminaga and I then spent the next hour eating cake and watching Hero TV recordings on the new TV the HPSC had installed across from my bed. It had obviously been done in some attempt to placate me over what had happened right under their own noses, but given most everything in this new world was largely transactional, I had zero problems reaping the rewards from other people's sense of guilt, even if I did have to suffer from a mind-scarring tertiary villain attack for me to get this kind of image resolution. Oh, before I go, I got you something, Kaminaga said as the Hero TV time slot came to an end, skipping over to the door and grabbing something she'd set down upon arrival. She rounded on her stylish high heels and deposited a large shopping bag topped with pink tissue paper into my arms with gratuitous use of her quirk. Happy early birthday. Ah, uh, that's right. About the only thing I had in common with Takeko Tokai was our date of birth. I never cared to memorize the exact minute I was considered born on that day, but I guess at present that was no longer important, setting the tissue paper aside and removing the bag's contents. I was both surprised and amazed to see a Chibai-style Hitomi Sensei plushie, clad in a pink blouse, black skirt, and white lab coat. Its limbs were stumpy and its head bigger than the body, so it looked like a Powerpuff Girl plushie all things considered. The reflective dark blue hair and yellow ribbon were all done to incredible detail. But what amazed me in quality the most was the gem-like mono eye set in the plushie's face atop a cute smile and rosy cheeks. This, this is, it's cute, Hakaminaga winked, and I swear to god a little five-pointed star jumped out at me. I made her myself, be very cute. I found myself stammering, looking into the plushie's mono eye before I hugged it to my chest, a nostalgic feeling washing over me before my eyes went wide. Noticed it, did you? Kaminaga winked, that's right, Chibai Manaka smells like the real thing too, you are K. I lurched in shock was what I now knew to be the scent of Hitomi's lavender shampoo washed over me. If this were an anime, this would be the part where the background went black and white cracks like a broken window spread out behind me in a halo. Honestly, getting Chibai-chan to smell just right was the hardest part. Compared to that, everything else was easy. The woman beamed ecstatically. But, this means a lot to you, doesn't it? I asked trying to give it back. The kid in me wanted to hug it and never let go. But I bowled through this body's immature hardware with my mature software. Oh don't worry, that one's my spare. The original Chibai Manaka-chan is waiting for me at home. Seeing the flushed expression on this busty woman's face, the way she was hugging herself and writhing in front of who, for all intents and purposes, was a prepubescent child. I couldn't help but ponder what sorts of depraved things Kamanaga did with her Hitomi Sensei plush. Come to think of it, what sorts of depraved things had she done with this one? And like that, I'm scarred for life. Again, thought I need friends my own age. Uh-huh. The following day, I learned what happened to that crazed nutball who tried cutting me open like a science lab frog. Due to the somewhat sensitive nature of what my biomass was being studied for, Dr. Shiga had been shipped off to Tartarus, one of the most secure super-criminal containment facilities in the world. Now, from the comic book side of things I was getting some Arkham Asylum, Strikers Island, Bell Reve vibes after learning about it. The reason supervillains weren't just killed off for everyone's convenience there was because a publication running out of antagonists had no real future, aside from spin-offs where the villains and or heroes did all get killed off like Deadpool kills the Marvel Universe, Deadpool kills the Marvel Universe again, the Marvel Universe kills Deadpool, etc etc. In the real world, where real people could turn into super criminals at any given moment from a population pool of over 5 billion with as many possible quirks or quirk combinations. The ability to capture super criminals alive and incarcerate them long term was both a show of the country's military might, as well as the strength of its heroes. Now that I was here, in such a world where superpowers were quite literally a dime in a dozen, the societal importance of being able to contain super criminals in such a fashion actually made sense. After all, if every quirk-related criminal were to be killed on sight or otherwise executed summarily, the world would probably turn into an oppressive regime like Superman's from the Injustice series where everyone feared their government. And if a people truly fears its government, then that country has no future. Probably why countries like North Korea and China no longer exist in their original forms in 22XX. But that's a story for another day. Getting back to the original point. This model for judicial incarceration only made logical sense in a world dominated by SPBs. In comic book worlds where SPBs were microscopically in the minority. It made non-literary sense to just kill them off if they were serial murderers. But that's neither here nor there. 
Sure, I'm pissed that Dr. Shiga isn't getting the axe for what he did, or if he is I just haven't been made aware. But even if I don't like that he's just being carted away instead of getting the chair or the needle or the gas or the firing squad, it's not like the government will take an 11-year-old's thoughts into consideration anyway. But hey, no one had broken out of Tartarus or any of its branch facilities yet in the world's history, so they must have been doing something right. Still, that left me in a very precarious position, at least from the perspective of the grown-ups around me. Here in this hospital adjacent to the Hero Public Safety Commission, I was supposed to be in a safe space. But, being blatantly attacked by a villain in this capacity, one who had been working under their own noses for over a year while being pathologically insane, it only made sense that I would demand answers. Cause after all, the moment I stopped feeling safe here was the moment I started making their lives a living hell by trying to escape. Thanks to my rehab and my slightly abnormal recovery speed, it would only be a matter of time before I could act on any hypothetical threat of flying the coop. Sure, I could make a break for the elevators, but this being a world of superheroes, I found myself in a very unique position to be able to carry out certain power fantasies I had back home when I thought about writing stories. If I couldn't make a break for the lobby, I could always smash out a window and scream to some nearby hero that I'm being held against my will at the top of my lungs. And in a world where heroes are beholden to their adoring public like politicians are to their constituents, they might very well have to take my pleas seriously. Uh huh. As it turned out however, I would not need to break any expensive windows. After Dr. Shiga's attack on my person, the powers that be were being very upfront about what the hell was going on. Sure, the possibility existed they were only offering this courtesy so I'd have no reason to become a villain or villain sympathizer in the future, but I'd take my lumps of sugar where I could find them. At the moment I found myself back in a familiar interrogation room-like space, only in more fair company than Tsukachi Neyamasa. Her name was Smith Kiroko, or Kiroko Smith from a western perspective. She was a tall leggy woman with fair skin, brown eyes, jet black hair cascading like water, and dressed in the attire of a typical government agent. White dress shirt, black tie, black blazer, matching professional skirt, black pantyhose, matching heels, and a pair of black sunglasses to complete the look. Smith, 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 that name sounded familiar. And I'd definitely seen her somewhere before in my previous life, but my reincarnation addled brain was drawing up blanks, or rather, fog, whenever I looked at her. It was like peering down into a bargain bin of DVDs at the mall and you could only see part of the cover art of a DVD you recognized at the bottom through all the others. Maybe she was a men in black character I'd forgotten about. Agent S. She certainly dressed for it, and, shit, was men in black actually fact in this universe instead of fiction? With the proliferation of mutant, heteromorphic quirks out there, it was certainly feasible for extraterrestrial life to hide out on this earth as refugees. No one would ever know the difference, if that were the case and I weren't just making correlations where there weren't any. It of course once again dawned on me that I had literally forgotten more first-hand knowledge about the multiverse than anyone else here could possibly ever hope to learn. So, I should probably start by saying that this isn't an ordinary hospital, Miss Smith hummed, breaking me from my internal thoughts. Uh-huh. Oh really? No shit? What gave it away? The fact that there's no one else on this floor but me? Takehiko asked, his voice oozing with sarcasm. Couldn't pull one over on you, could we? I asked with a raised brow. Not on your best day. Which was fair, since Dr. Shiga had been far from subtle when he finally went off the deep end. So, you finally going to tell me why I'm HPSCHQ adjacent? Tell me, how much do you know about all for one? Other than being an old wives tale like the Boogeyman to keep up any little shits in line, I know that, hypothetically. He said making air quotes, if he were real, his is the most dangerous sort of power in a world where powers are everything. After all, what sort of hero would risk losing their paycheck and the lifestyle to which they'd become accustomed over a villain who could steal their quirks with a love tat? Well you sound pretty jaded, I hummed idly, crossing one leg over the other to break the tension. It would later occur to me, retrospectively, that if he actually had hormones to rile up and there weren't a table between the two of us, that tactic would have worked much better. I've been attacked by villains three times over in just as many years. What do you think? Fair point. I conceded. I'll probably catch all sorts of hell for this later, but Hitomi's a friend of a friend so I'll be straight with you. Why was I being so upfront with this kid? Simple. Because I couldn't even begin to count the number of children, teenagers, and young adults who grew up to become villains because some government asshole in a black suit screwed them over and disenfranchised them to the system. Sure, it wasn't a perfect system, but it was the only one we had and if anything, it worked. This all for one guy who might have attacked you, if not just someone with a clone quirk. Something about your quirk factor didn't really agree with him. So you people think my DNA is the magic bullet that can kill this all for one guy? The kid interrupted, assuming he's actually real, at least, more like, incapacitate. 
There's nothing inherently toxic about your DNA when introduced to a secondary body, I answered, wondering where a boy his age learned the term magic bullet. People had stopped believing in magic anything when quirks started manifesting. Don't you have some kind of quirk suppressant to keep this guy in line? Or does Tartarus rely on nano-explosives implanted in their spinal columns for that? Where the hell did you come up with that idea? Sounds to me like you're deflecting. What? No, we don't do that. Maybe not in this country. I'm sure human rights violations happen somewhere in the world. Christ, this kid was jaded as fuck. No, suffice it to say, all for one isn't exactly the sort to sit still for. That sort of thing. And you can't just take him out with a drone strike because he either has a healing quirk or a drone control quirk. Technically speaking, all for one was declared dead three years ago. And you're still planning for him making a comeback because no one found a body. Jeez, what kind of orphanage did they put this kid in? What kind of 11-year-old thinks this way? Something like that. Well, at the very least you don't have to worry about me narking on you to anyone for telling me all this. Jeez, how considerate of you. Still not sure how I feel about you guys harvesting me for meat, though. I mean, yeah, I was in a coma so you probably used a loophole, but I'm not sure how I feel about it now. Hey, to be fair, the only reason that shit flew for the last year was because Dr. Shiga's quirk let him make it so there weren't any marks on you after we got our samples. And you couldn't just clone the tissue samples you needed instead. He asked skeptically with a raised eyebrow. I'm not saying you should have made anything smart enough to do algebra, but there's still a great deal about the quirk factor we don't understand. To put it as simply as I can, freshness counts. You can't just clone a quirk factor and cram it into someone else. And yet, you think the guy from the orphanage was a cheap knockoff instead of the real McCoy? Okay, seriously. Was the kid a history buff before coming in here or what? Real McCoy? Who talks like that anymore? Is he some sort of time traveler? That's a very strong possibility, I stated, lest he catch me spacing out. Well, I mean, if it's that important to you, can't you just find someone else with a quirk like that nutty professor? Not that I want to get carved up, but if you just put me under for a bit and actually pay me this time, we would. But healing quirks are incredibly rare. Even with such a wide pool to draw from, I answered. Government agencies and criminal organizations alike scoop them up as soon as rumors of miracles start floating about. And even with mandatory quirk registration in this country, people can still slip through the cracks or have their records misplaced. I continued. There is a faculty member at UE with a healing quirk, but she can only accelerate the body's own healing ability, so hers would leave behind scars. And even then I doubt she'd ever consent to harvesting biomass from a living person, no matter how noble the purpose. Well, figured I might as well try. The kid sighed. Do you need blood? I can probably give that away. The only other fluid I think you'd find useful won't be ready until my, ahem, male genitalia fully descend from my abdominal cavity. He phrased carefully. Kid, I deal with villains all the time. You're allowed to say until my balls drop to this lady. Seriously, though, what kid talks like this? It's like talking to a grown man in a kid's body. Heh, <sighs> maybe he was an ice guy Yuasha who happened to wake up in a comatose body. The uh huh, so how did things with Smith's and go? Hitomi asked the next time she came around. Okay, ish, I replied. I'm not really sure what's going to happen with me now, I said running a hand up my arm. It was faint, but I could feel very slight changes in texture from where Dr. Shiga had cut bits of me away before using his quirk to, allegedly, regrow the lost tissue. It still disgusted me that Dr. Shiga's various psychoses flew under the radar so long. Oh, Hitomi hummed, looking at her shoes somberly before raising her eye to meet mine. I was against it the entire time, you know. After I found out, I mean. But when they told me about all the lives you could save, I don't go thinking you're a sellout. This is on them. Not you, I said as she became downcast. I'm just happy you stuck around long enough to wake me up from that coma. T. Takechan. Itomi whimpered, her hands going to her mouth and tears falling from her eye before she reached over and embraced me. You're too good for this world. I'm not even from this world. I wasn't 100% sure if I should feel guilty over this whole reincarnation thing. But it still gnawed at me like rats. Itomi Sensei. HM. I. Um. I'll tell you later, I sighed, chickening out at the last moment. I'll tell her someday. Someday. Uh huh. Don't judge me. This is a very delicate issue. On the one hand, Itomi might think I went into my chuni phase early, which would completely undermine any attempt of mine to get the truth out. I'd seen enough anime and read enough manga to know, even as an American, that the whole reincarnation angle is a done to death favorite among those with middle school syndrome. On the other, she might feel completely betrayed that it wasn't her patient that woke up, 
but a late twenty-something man from another universe who reincarnated into the body she'd been taking care of for a year straight. No matter what I do, it'll change the dynamic of our relationship when I tell her, so my only real choice is to hold off on doing so until I'm 100% sure what kind of reincarnation it was. The devil is in the details, after all. Unfortunately, with my PBSD the way it is, I'll have to put up with some rando bugging me for however many days a week the higher-ups in the HPSC are willing to pay him in, or her for to assuage their guilty conscience of failing to properly screen that complete and total nut bar. Honestly, though, I'm surprised they were so forthcoming with psychological aid. From what I vaguely recall, going to a shrink for anything in 21st century Japan was highly frowned upon since the nail that stands up gets hammered down. Of course, with the proliferation of meta-abilities and the various psychoses, complexes that came about from having or not having them, I guess it made sense that the stigma against shrinks in Japan would change over time. I was thankful for the opportunity, at least. If I let this fester like a mental illness, I really might become a villain someday. And even if I didn't have a quirk, the meta-knowledge I brought here with me from my original world could be very dangerous. Bruce Wayne, Batman might not have a meta-ability, but his ideas were what made him truly dangerous, so dangerous in fact he could topple literal gods in most of his comic book runs. At the very least, the present world I reincarnated into wasn't based on an anime I'd been familiar with, otherwise who knows the kind of damage I could have caused. Still, something's been nagging on my mind. It's been on the tip of my nose, but I just can't grasp it. Ah well, if it were important, I would have remembered it upon reincarnating. Tomorrow's problems for tomorrow's me. Uh huh. The problem that I found waiting for yesterday's me the day after was my child psychiatrist, who also had a minor in treating PVSD. Her name was Dr. Wong, and she was completely ordinary, at least in physical appearance. She had smile lines around her lips, square glasses with thick frames, parted black hair, and drab clothing over a yellow blouse. For all intents and purposes she was an average middle-aged Japanese woman you could have found anywhere in pre-paranormality Japan. By the way, racist name is what I had enough tact not to say out loud after finding out her name. Not only would it be wildly racist to say so, possibly, but the reference would fly right over her head assuming Rick and Morty is also a thing here. As for the room itself, it wasn't Dr. Wong's dedicated office, and was thus sparsely furnished with the bare essentials. The only thing that really stood out to me was the stereotypical therapy couch upholstered in dark brown leather, which I was currently laying down upon. Now then, take Hiko kun tell me how you're feeling, Dr. Wong began, adjusting her glasses. About the villain attack, I mean, really, that tired old line, fine, whatever, might as well lay it all out on the table. It made me feel hurt, it made me feel inadequate, like I'm not good enough. Oh, well, that's a very mature response for someone your age, Dr. Wong hummed as she scrutinized me. I assume all the rest of her child patients denied they were scared in any fashion until the cows came home, and that she had to work a lot harder to break this much ground. Is it wrong of me to assume your past experiences with villains has somehow galvanized you against the real world? She continued. I mean, it matured me to the point I feel like a late 20-something and a body too young for it, so you tell me. Feels good to get some of that off my chest. HM, yes, that's a common result of surviving a villain attack during your formative years. The woman mused. Which brings me to my next question. How do you feel about heroes, since it was completely ordinary people who saved you? I'm not counting Hawks because he only appeared at the very end and you were succinctly traumatized before his arrival. I mean, my opinion of heroes is still pretty neutral. I don't worship the ground they walk on, but I don't hate them either. And I'm not delusional enough to think that heroes create the villains they fight simply by existing. Or that if heroes disappeared people would stop being complete assholes to one another and villains would stop popping up every five minutes. I returned, a little bitterly. If anything, I'm honestly more interested in the corporate heroes because their true colors as a hero shine when it's more literally their paycheck on the line and they could be dismissed at any moment. So your interest lies in the progenitor of the current heroic age, Dr. Wong said holding her chin. I can't say I'm not surprised. People try to pretend that things have changed from back then, but fights between heroes and villains are still largely treated as stage shows for excitable children or inconveniences for working adults because they're made late for work. That is what it feels like, yes, I nodded. Fact of the matter was, quirk-related crimes were so woefully common whenever they occurred, that thanks to cell phone cameras and social media, there really wasn't any profit to be made in hero TV-style programming anymore. The closest you got were the high-profile chases the Ingenium Agency sometimes resolved, or the hero chasers who put their lives on the line to get in your face footage of hero versus villain fights. On to the next topic, Dr. Wong said taking notes. From what I understand, while well, your nurse's father was fighting that villain, for some reason, I hated how that word seemed to elevate the mentally ill. You asked her younger sister too. 
gauss you in medical ethanol and set you on fire so they could escape while Dr. Shiga was, hypothetically, scrambling to put you out, she said reading what must have been an incident report. She it. Now, altruism isn't completely dead in this day and age, but what you suggested be done to you, that speaks of a much deeper self-loathe. Before you go off thinking I entertain thoughts of self-immolation on a recreational basis, or that I have a death wish, let me make something abundantly clear to you, I said cutting her off, leaning on my elbow and looking her dead in the eye. Those restraints weren't coming off any time soon, and with Dr. Shiga hopped up on super steroids, I wasn't exactly swimming in options. I tried stalling, but all that did was buy enough time for ordinary people to show up and put themselves in danger. Itomi Sensei's dad almost got killed, and if Hawks hadn't come in when he did, I don't know who would have won way I saw it. If I was going to die horribly while strapped to an operating table anyway, I might as well die quickly. At least if I burned to death it'd be over quickly, as opposed to the alternative which was basically me role-playing as Ikesukuri. Fucked up thing about that was, the first time I saw that happen wasn't on a YouTube video. It was in a tragedy manga called Trash where some poor woman got prepared like live sushi in front of a bunch of Yakuza, and I didn't even have to go to the dark web to find it. That shit was on the regular old internet for everyone to see. You do realize in either scenario, you'd have still wound up dead, right? Dead is still dead. It's just a matter of how long the universe drags it out for, I said flatly. And at least if my plan panned out, Hitomi and the others could have gotten away with their own lives. I'd rather my last moments not be guilt-ridden with thoughts of how I got other people killed alongside me. My last death didn't jar me all that much since, as far as I can remember, it was basically instantaneous. If I'd been fatally hit by truck kun like every other every other ice guy hero, assuming the hit didn't kill me on impact, my death would have drug out for however long it took my body to give up from its injuries and just croak. In the latter case, the trauma similarly would have been more impactful. In a way, it made sense as to why I was as callous about self-immolation as I had been, knowing with a glut of certainty that reincarnating into another world, while unlikely, was it the least possible, did that to you. It was either that, or some sort of brain abnormality the CT scan hadn't picked up. Either way, I was pretty sure I was cracked, which I guess was no big secret after what I'd told Mitsumi to do to me. Take Hiko-kun. You can't honestly expect to be able to defend yourself from a grown villain as a child, do you? Dr. Wung asked sympathetically. Doesn't matter whether or not I could have defended myself. Doesn't matter how close I came to getting turned into Ike Sukuri. That guy got a one-way trip to Tartarus and he's never coming up for air again, so the way I see it, I don't need to give that guy a second thought anymore. Normally I'd say that isn't a healthy way of handling things, but you are right in a way I suppose. In most circumstances, getting sentenced to Tartarus is a one-way trip. Isn't it normal for people to stop thinking of villains after they get caught and sent to jail? I'm sensing air quotes in your dialogue. Would you care to explain why? It's so stupid. People just arbitrarily. Elevating criminals into villains just because they have a gimmick, I said bitterly, speaking my mind. Everyone treats it like a spectator sport, never once giving thought to how easily they could get dragged into a fight, how quickly something could go horribly wrong. They never stop to think about all the people that aren't saved by heroes, or even how some of the heroes they idolize so much only care for the prestige and couldn't give a rat's ass about saving people when the cameras aren't rolling. Sure, I thought a real-life world of heroes and villains was cool, but that didn't mean I wasn't still critical of it. Hell, I only got more critical of the current system the longer I lived inside of it as an unwilling participant. In Sternbuild, Albert Maverick had orchestrated crimes for one of the earliest licensed meta-ability users, Mr. Legend, to stop so that way those with meta-abilities would have a future in a world then dominated by those without quirks. Without his machinations in the timeline I'd observed paving the way for those with quirks to find acceptance by the general population, even going as far as to lay down the groundwork for what legally constituted a villain in this brave new world to give those with and without quirks a common enemy. The schism between those without quirks and those that had them would have only continued to grow until the world reached its breaking point. So basically, if he hadn't done what he did when he did, there's no way the then-current law-abiding society would have even lasted long enough for quirk users to eclipse the quirkless. Some might see it as evil, but whether he knew it or not, he and Auroboros had laid down the groundwork for the longest uninterrupted period of peace the world had ever known. To paraphrase Robert Downey Jail, in his role as Tony Stark, Maverick had successfully privatized world peace without even realizing it. Nowadays, with all their posturing and grandstanding and self-aggrandizing, most of the heroes I saw on TV came off as being no different than Red Nose from One Punch Man. And trust me, that was a L-O-W-W-W bar to straddle and then bust your nuts on. The longer I observed this world and all the issues that went ignored, the more this system's flaws showed through the veneer. 
People think that peace is something they're entitled to, a paid-for house they get to live in rent-free, but that isn't true in the slightest. This world's current society, which seems so sturdily built on the backs of heroes and psychics and support companies, and even on the backs of the villains the aforementioned fought, is just a temporary resting place, a hotel we checked into for vacation that we must one day check out at. No matter how we cling to it, the moment we stop fighting for it is the moment the check comes due. I could only pray that this world didn't wear me down until the point I became so disenfranchised with it that I did something monumentally stupid like joining the dark side. Uh huh. After that, while she scribbled the session's observation on her notepad, Dr. Wong gave me what sounded like a canned speech meant for survivors of villain attacks geared towards soliciting future sessions while glazing over the exorbitant fees. However, since it wasn't me paying the tab, I just decided to tell her that future sessions were still on the table and went on my way. All for one. Come to think of it, Naomasa almost shat a brick when I placed one for all and all for one together in a sentence. But if all for one was basically the demon lord in a world of heroes and not just a line from a dead Frenchman's book from hundreds of years ago, what the hell was one for all supposed to be? Some kind of horrifying weapon like the soul cannon, something that inexorably exhausted the life of the user for the sake of others. I suppose in a way comic book heroism itself was like the soul cannon. With guys like Peter Parker, Spider-Man putting so much of themselves into their work they neglected their real lives and suffered for it. Sure, it was meant to be inspiring, a man giving of himself for the greater good no matter how much it set them back. But you could only watch a chronically miserable guy wallow about in a shitty apartment with no girlfriend for so long before you got sick of it. Unfortunately, it seems like that particular brand of heroism died with Kotsu Kaburaga's generation. True, the commercialization and privatization of super-powered law enforcement made the world the safest it had ever been, with Japan having a world record low of 6% compared to the rest of the world's 20%. But at the same time, what it meant to actually be a hero had all but vanished from the public eye thanks to a system that actively rewarded selfishness and punished altruism. Well, it's not like there's anything I can do about it. Ideals without power are a joke, but power without ideals are hollow. Problem for me was I had no power and thus nothing to weigh in on things. Hopefully this world had some kind of chosen one to save it, because I've read enough comics to know that this right here, it won't last, and knowing my shitty luck, I'll live Jewess long enough for the next civil war, secret war, identity crisis, or Superman theory to cause this whole house of cards to come tumbling down. Christ, I really am cracked, aren't I? Takekun, HM, how was today's therapy? Did everything turn out okay? Hitomi asked sweetly as she walked up to me. A cherubic smile on her face. Well, I suppose there's some good to be found in this world. Yeah, I think I'm going to be okay. Harlecking 31. You know it's chapter 9 and for a Ratchet and Clank crossover we're talking it awfully slow to start Ratchet and Clank. For the MC, I mean. We had the setup orchestrated by Clank after all. Also I take it as slow-mo is for aiming and shooting the guns. And I guess Hatsum will get to go nuts when making said guns. Three. Let's just say that Rift Apart leave a lot of wiggle room for the whole Ice Guy angle. And leave it at that. Lomi coffee. Oh I know about Twice's whole thing. Doesn't mean I can't be sad that it happened. Nice POV change. Though I do feel for Take with all his worries. Like all the dialogue in this. I'm getting so invested in the relationships. Re. In any sort of ice guy. With so many of them done to death. I feel like it's the relationships that keep people's interest. That's certainly how it works with me. A gimmick alone can only do so much to hold my attention. Uh huh. Smith san. Take kun is not doing okay. What do you mean? Hiroko asked, eager for any excuse to take a break from her mountains of paperwork. As long as she was consulting with someone from the HPSC's medical branch about an ongoing matter, no one could accuse her of slacking off. He's been putting up a strong front for me, and he's been going to his therapy and rehab, but he doesn't smile anymore. He thinks I don't notice, but I do. His expression, it's completely hollow whenever he thinks I'm not looking. What's worse is, I think I'm the only one to notice. The only one who cares. Well, he did narrowly survive another villain attack. I mean, seriously, three in one lifetime. Sure, he survived. But I don't think he thinks this place is safe anymore. Itomi whimpered. Takiko. Wow, if she were using his actual name, it had to be serious. He. He stopped watching Hero TV. It's his favorite thing in the world. But now, all he does is train, eat, and sleep. What, like some kind of health nut? No, more like an anime protagonist. Oof, that is bad. And it really was. In a world of meta abilities where you could find anime protagonists with their own unique power on every street corner, to have a very real person dedicate their every waking moment and impulse to physical conditioning and nothing else, that was truly a sign that someone had reached their limit. Hell, surviving even one villain attack was enough to make someone want to dedicate every fiber of their being into becoming a hero, so for someone to endure that threefold, yet have no hope of becoming a hero, 
or even the desire to. We need to get him out of here, Hitomi spoke up, knocking her from her internal monologue. With Dr. Shiga out of the picture, now is the perfect opportunity. If they manage to vet another person with a medicinal quirk, they might not ever let him go. The time to act is now. Well, it's nice to see you have a little backbone Smith hummed. Don't worry, I'm sure all of us on our end will be able to think of something. Please, just, we need to save him. We have to, because no one else will, Smith finished with a nod. Uh-huh. So, I was finally allowed to leave whatever floor I'd been being kept on for the past year. I still couldn't leave the building wholesale, but it was implied that as long as I kept my mouth shut, I'd be able to move about with the other patients. The majority were heroes, no one I knew from the news, but the rest were either related to heroes who pulled some strings to get them the best care in the country, or had been injured in a villain attack in such a way that it'd be embarrassing to the HPSC if they became motivated to talk openly about certain organizational flaws to the media. Stepping out of my own little gilded cage for the first time, I was able to see for certain the sheer diversity of meta-abilities in this world, not so much in what was being used, but listening to patients dick measure about their quirks, whose were stronger, whose were cooler, or seeing just how far heteromorphic abilities could warp the human body. I mean seriously, quirks that made you look like clowns, or robots, or Lego blocks. I mean, sure, I already had some idea that a number of quirks would purely vestigial like in the X-Men, but honestly, why would having a quirk that gave you a head like a Lego block be considered better than no quirk at all? For the time being I chose to ignore everyone, putting up with them as little as possible. I'd read books in the library and take my meals in whatever private corner I could find. But what really caught my attention was the private gym. The name Silverman stirred something in my memory, but like many of them, that too was muddled. Didn't matter, I finally had something I could pour all my nervous energy into, and the buffet of top-of-the-line gym equipment was more than able to accommodate. Wow, look at him go. What kind of quirk do you think he has? Gotta be strength. No way, looks like high-speed punching to me. Oh, like the high-speed hero, a clock. I tried to tune out the peanut gallery's speculation on what my non-existent quirk was, disgusted but utterly numb to the fact that people put so much importance on quirks, that the idea of hard work existing independent of one was completely foreign to them. I wasn't even doing anything all that special, just punching the sandbag as fast as my body would allow. I may or may not have been pretending I was beating Dr. Shiga within an inch of his life. Listening to them prattle, I could somewhat understand where anti-meta comic book organizations like the Purifiers and Cadmus and so on were coming from. Not about the whole genocide angle, but wanting ordinary people to not be considered lesser by people whose abilities were completely random. These people were so arrogant. Their noses turned up at anything without a meta ability, that it was a miracle the quirkless population hadn't flat out revolted yet, or just hunted them to extinction when they had the chance. Not that I would have advocated for shit like talentless Nana to occur. Nor would I be cool with an organization like the Creature Rejection Cult which I still hated with a passion. As far as I knew, there wasn't any mainstream anti-quirk organization out there, and hate crimes by the quirkless against their polar opposites were a rarity. Of course, between the quirk singularity theory and the quirk extinction theory, the quirkless could very well get their day in court once the dust settled. But hell, I was still banking on the complete and utter collapse of hero society predating any hypothetical of that far-flung nature. We're focusing on what I was doing. Hands brought up to my face, as I planted my feet and started to weave back and forth, I struck out at the sandbag with a deluge of hooks that made it bounce from side to side, a steady pow 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 filling the air. Uo, that must be his future super move. The figure eight punch. Another bellowed. I hate this world and everyone in it. MHA. Smith san, I need a status report. Hitomi said into her phone as Takeko walked out on her, likely to the gym if his clothes were any indicator. I brought it up with the others, and we've been workshopping a few ideas. Well, tell them to double time it, because I've been doing some digging on my end, and our window of opportunity will close in just short of a week. Oh, what did you find out? The HPSC has been putting out feelers for a replacement for Dr. Shiga after he got shipped off to Tartarus, and according to the head of the Foreign Affairs Office, they're in negotiations with someone in America who might allow them to resume Takeko's ongoing biological studies. Oh, and how'd you dig something like that up? I. Had to bat my eye at the old pervert, show a little skin. Itomi shuddered in revulsion. He didn't get his hands on me. But it's both amazing and mortifying how much confidential information a man will let slip if you undo an extra button or hike up your skirt. The man's eyes also never drifted above her neckline from the moment she entered the room. But she didn't need to burden Ms. Smith with that bit of dirty laundry. Well, you know how pricey these medicinal quirk users are. The HPSC can't let it slip why they need a quirk like that before he's in the country, so they will take their time of it so they don't tip their hand. Not to mention, with stars and stripes growing in prominence, American immigration into Japan has been decreasing bit by bit, so anyone who does is under greater scrutiny. 
So with all this in mind, six days, let's make it five, Smith replied. I'll consult legal, see what our options are. Smith, you're legal. Hitomi deadpanned. Fuck, well, guess I'd better get working then. You keep working on Takiko Kun. Get him ready to leave without letting him know we're getting him ready to leave. If we tip our hand too soon, there's no telling what the president will do to us. Please, hurry. I don't know how much longer I can let him suffer like this. MHA. Hitomi had been acting strangely the past couple of days, asking me what kind of food I wanted to get as soon as I was out of the hospital, what kind of school I'd like to go to, what tourist spots in Japan I'd like to visit, what I'd do with my own room. Part of me thinks she's plotting something, but given I'm surrounded by plots and intrigue, and in a world of superheroes that just screams there's always another secret, I could just as easily be jumping at shadows. The fact that I'd checked whatever paper money I could find for vaguely Nordic watermarks may have also been proof that I was digging too deeply into this world's dark side to be considered healthy. At the very least, I had a number of theories on that front to work on. Auroboros didn't exist in this reality. B. Auroboros did exist but not domestically, or C. Auroboros. If the aforementioned a divided by B were applicable, was smart enough in the modern day to not tag paper money with their gang sign like in the version of Sternbild I'd seen, when I wasn't leering at every dark shadow searching for psychotic villains to run away from, I dedicated the whole of my time to physical conditioning. I mean sure, I still love the old school heroes like Wild Tiger, Origami Cyclone, and Dragon Kid, but I just couldn't find it in myself to enjoy watching them fight long dead villains and villains anymore. Not when there were only so many hours in the day I could make any real use of before my. This body gave out from exhaustion. I never really talked to anyone in the gym, and if that made me come across as antisocial or standoffish, that was fine with me. I didn't intend on ever working with any of these people, not in their field of profession, and arrogant SOBs like them made for poor company anyway. Hell, everyone down here tended to be so self-centered, I doubt they even noticed. The sun had already begun to set by the time my body started flagging the onset of genuine fatigue, but since Hitomi and the other nurses kept foisting a wheelchair onto me, I figured as long as I could wheel myself back to my room, I could at least push myself to that level of exhaustion. As I rewatched the clips on YouTube archive I'd flagged for myself, trying to get the Dempsey roll right, I felt eyes on me. Though then again, maybe it was my wanton paranoia making my hair stand on end. It wasn't that I intended to get into fistfights if shit ever went pear-shaped again. I just wanted to make sure if I did get caught up in any comic book bullshit, I'd at least go down swinging, leave behind a black eye or two as well as a beautiful corpse as the saying goes. As for why I was using boxing and MMA videos as reference material, I couldn't exactly ask for martial arts training, not in this day and age as a quirkless person that had just raised too many red flags since the modern MMA scene was dominated by heteromorphs, and boxing by remote-controlled robots like in Real Steel, though in the case of the latter, it was centralized to North America. No, as much as it sucked, if I ever wanted to be able to defend myself, no one was going to help me but me. And sure, Jack Dempsey had been dead for over two centuries, and his clips were largely in black and white, but it didn't change the fact that his knockouts were among the most beautiful to be found in the back when times. And it doesn't matter what quirk a person has, if I can make their brain rattle, even a little, at the very least I can make an opening for myself to haul ass. As I went through repetition after repetition, chugging water from the cooler to stave off the near-crippling exhaustion as much as I could, that hair-raising feeling got too irritating to ignore, and I rounded on the purported source of my unease, sitting back against the wall. A gnarled wooden cane in hand was an extremely short elderly man with heavy wrinkles and a scrawny build. He had a light complexion, brown eyes, and spiky gray hair styled short with a trimmed beard. His attire consisted of hospital scrubs much like mine, though it seemed like even a child's small was too big for the guy, as shrunken with age as he'd become. Hell, his feet didn't even reach the floor anymore. Who are you? I asked of the very Yoda-like man. That was just the sort of vibe he gave off. Torino. The old man replied hopping from his seat, his cane tapping loudly on the floor as he hobbled over. It's rare, you know, he hummed aloud, finding any sort of work ethic independent of a quirk I mean. Yeah, I figured, I muttered, since in all the time I'd come to the gym, everyone had some form of quirk, no matter how minimal. It was like every quirkless person I'd met stopped caring after they were four years old, while even the smallest amount of work was enough to inflate the ego of a quirk user. Not that I felt too bad for the quirkless population. If they've all given up on themselves, that's on them, not me. Let them wallow in their misery or pursue unrealistic dreams, but me. I intend to let my labor define me, not whatever superpower I do or don't have. 
and being quirkless is only a pitfall close to big hero academies like Yui or Shaikzu where elitism was the norm. Both were places I'd avoid like the plague as long as I could help it. You know, you actually remind me of one of my students, Torino idly hummed. He wanted to become a hero more than anything, even when everyone told him no. And let me guess, he either died trying, or got some bullshit power because he was a late bloomer, I spat. You don't think very highly of quirks, do you? The old man hummed with a raised brow. Quirks, no, no, I don't have a problem with those. Quirks are just a tool, I said shaking my head ruefully. It's the people, I spat. The day you're born. It's a Russian roulette to see if Super Jesus will grant you some awesome power, and if he thinks you're not worth it, well. You could be a successful businessman or a brilliant scientist. But you'll always be considered second-rate to someone half as good as you as long as they have a quirk and you don't. Hell, even having a damn Lego block for a head is considered awe-inspiring, I spat. Well, I won't deny that isn't somewhat true, the old man admitted. Honestly, if some huge scandal or something utterly destroys the current system, I sure as hell won't be too broken up over it. A rotten tree can only bear rotten fruit, no matter how much you pretty it up with trimming or fresh fertilizer or flower beds. And someday, the hatchet man will come to knock it all down. I huffed, idly wondering in the back of my mind why I was trying to validate my viewpoint to this complete stranger. Maybe it was the whole Yoda thing. Yes, well, hopefully I'll be dead before that happens and it can be someone else's problem. The man called Torino said adjusting his grip on his cane. An interesting response. Most of the time whenever I got riled up and went off on a tangent like this, people acted like I had blasphemed against their god and deed, or just thought I was practicing to become a news pundit or at the very least that I was being sarcastic, that this guy wasn't looking at me like he wanted to melt my face with laser eyes, had me thinking maybe he was a retired hero who'd seen enough of the world to find the cracks in the veneer, and was too fed up with something broken to bother defending it anymore. So what are you in for? I asked making small talk. Oh, my arthritis been acting up. Joints ain't what they used to be. But hey, figured I'd actually use these benefits I'd paid into for so long before I croaked. The old man shrugged as he walked up to my punching bag of choice. Squinted eyes appraised the slick smear overlapping the vampiric face I'd crudely drawn and marker on its white vinyl surface, and then to my fighting implements of choice. You know that isn't good for you, right? I'm a fast healer, I grunted, ignoring the ache, burn, and tingle of my split knuckles as my fingers stuck together. Hell, half the time when this happened, people assumed it was some sort of liquid armor or some other nonsense, and they let me be. I wasn't about to disparage them of their jackassery. No skin off my nose. And as long as this body could heal from minor wounds like this overnight, I might as well take advantage. Sure, when you're young, but if you're trying to impress a girl, scars can only get you so far, Torino huffed. That look in your eyes. I take it you've had a brush with death. And recently at that, something like that, I returned, clenching and unclenching my fists. I can't count on anybody to save me, but me. That's a dangerous mentality to have nowadays. And crime's the lowest it's been in years. You saying I'm wrong. Now I never said that, Baoya, Torino shrugged. Still, you really should take better care of yourself. That pretty nurse of yours has been skulking after you the past half hour, and she looks worried sick. Looking up over my shoulder, I caught the hint of a jewel-colored eye as its owner slipped back from the doorframe with an adorable squeak, ebony hair and that same jewel-like eye peeking out to look at me a few seconds later. Hey, I sighed, my gut twisting in knots as Atomi came up to me with an aid kit in her hands and a hurt look in her eye, disinfectant already at the ready. Uh-huh. So, I see you've been training. Hitomi hummed as she wrapped my hands. Yeah, you've been working very hard, you know. The only way I know how. Just, take care of yourself, okay? I always do. No, you don't. Ouch. I just, I'm just, tired. Tired of villain this, villain that. Peace of mind's the only peace I'm ever gonna get. There are people who will help you. Yeah, and look how well that turned out. Damn, I'm sorry. I didn't mean for it to come out that way. Hey, I wasn't too proud to admit when I was wrong. And out of the many things quirkless people could be nowadays, proud was rarely one of them. Just, try to hold on a little longer, Hitomi pleaded. Uh huh, just try to hold on a little longer. What the heck did that mean? Eh, hey, probably some BS they told you in this world to keep you going to therapy. Hey, as long as I wasn't footing the bill. You're wasting a lot of energy, you know. Too many unnecessary movements. This guy again. I'm not one of your trainees, so why do you care? Call it nostalgia. The old man hummed as he hobbled over to me, tapping at my calves with his cane. Your footwork's shoddy too. Self-teaching only works for quirks, unless you happen by someone with the exact same ability who's been using it longer. You want to learn how to fight with your fists, how to do it the right way, that takes effort. Why are you still here anyway? A. Higher-ups want to keep me around for a while, so they're paying for the whole nine yards. Blood work, CT scan, the kit and capital, he shrugged as he walked around me, eyeing my stance. Was this student of yours really such a big deal? 
Would you care even if I told you? Honestly. No, I shrugged. Wild Tiger. Now that was a hero worth idolizing. Wild Tiger. That's an old name I haven't heard in a long time. What, you a history buff too? Something like that. Toshi was a bit of a muscle head with a lot of talent, but little else. So I used the old hero TV recordings as a baseline for how he should and shouldn't use his ability. Production quality back then was way better than what hero chasers can get with their phones and the like. Well, at least one other person could see what I saw in Wild Tiger. On the off chance I ever did become a hero, I'd have to make that name mean something again. Of course, I only envisioned that happening if I stumbled into the sort of ice guy bullshit that grants me some awesome power that's either opus from the get-go, or has the potential to become opus after a lot of work, and I didn't count my TTD because its mechanical limits were already firmly established. Music was nice too, won't argue with him there. I won't be a proper fighter, if anything I'll just learn to fight dirty. Well, don't think of it as cheating, think of it as winning. Don't be afraid of throwing mud in their eye, even if you have to get your hands dirty. Is that really something you should be telling an impressionable child? Why should I care? I'm not your grandparent. Fair point, I shrugged. So, what other pieces of wisdom do you got for me? Uh-huh, they kick Okan. Itomi asked, stepping into my room that evening. HM, I hummed, looking up from my refresher materials to see her smiling broadly. What's got you in such a good mood? I have something for you. Something, left for you by your parents. She said hauling in a heavy trunk on a dolly. It looked like an old steamer covered in faded red leather and metal trimmings that had desaturated with age. Your parents. My parents. No, not mine. His. You know, I've been meaning to ask. I hummed awkwardly, wondering how to bring this particular subject up. Do I have any sort of inheritance waiting for me when I leave? Most of it. Most of it was sold in an estate sale after they were killed by that villain so you wouldn't inherit their debts? Hitomi answered. This, the stuff that was yours, was earmarked and set aside for when you left. Left the orphanage, she finished awkwardly, setting the trunk down with a grunt. Hum. I hummed as I looked at the trunk, the gears in my head turning. In a way, what had happened to his parents' material assets and estate following that villain attack made sense. If a villain kills a kid's parents but that kid inherited the parents' debts, then they're more likely to become a villain later on in the future on account of the system fucking them over, since villains were as much a product of society as they were the poor decision-making of the individual. Then it made sense why government relief such as this had become so important, since a child couldn't really be expected to square away their own parents' tap, or at least that was my speculation on it. In a world where anyone from 80% of the populace could become a dangerous super-criminal with a wildly unpredictable meta-ability, it only made sense to stem the tide as much as possible, even if the current government policies were nothing more than a Dutch boy patching up the real problems that went on being ignored. The me that was, well me, had no real attachment to anything that belonged to my host body. However, the innate curiosity of myself, and something much deeper than that, compelled me to walk over to the old steamer. Seeing that there was a lock on the front, Hitomi frantically scrambled in her coat before withdrawing an old key and offering it to me, the lock opening a moment later with little fuss. The left half of the steamer trunk was dominated by a large wooden block like mahogany with a handle on top and brass case locks. The interior of the steamer trunk padded to hold it snugly in place. The right half of the steamer trunk, separated by a dividing wall, was filled with a number of personal effects, though the wooden block on the left interested me more. Pulling the case free and setting it on the nearby table, I blinked in nostalgia as I beheld something that strongly reminded me of the scene in Toy Story 2 where the old man who played chess with himself for was called in to repair Woody after his arm finally came off. The dimensions weren't 100% identical, but the form and the function were. Opening it up revealed an array of tools and supplies not dedicated to the playing of chess or the repair of collectible toys. But timepieces as an array of clockwork parts revealed themselves to me. Mainsprings, wheel trains, escapements, oscillators, and so on in numerous shapes, sizes, colors, and materials arrayed themselves before me, as well as a clamp dedicated to holding a watch casing down as the inner workings were meticulously assembled. Whoa! Ah. So many tools and moving parts. Hitomi awed, a lance of pain shooting me between the eyes like a carpentry nail as silk gave way to old, now currently new, memories. That's right, my I mean, take Hiko's parents. They were horologists. They made, maintained, and fixed watches and clocks for everyone from the working man to the wealthy. I thought as flashes of formerly lost memories came to the surface. The only thing that stopped me from accepting them as my own memories was that my I mean to Kiko's parents looked completely different from the parents that reared and raised me before I reincarnated. As long as I could pick heteromorphs out of the crowd and the memories swirling around upstairs, it was easy to differentiate between my original and new memories. I idly wondered if this is what the flash felt like after the first flashpoint having to juggle between memories from different timelines, turning toward the personal effects in the other side of the trunk. 
The first thing that caught my eye was a wooden case with a glass lid, the name Tokai etched in the top and stylized like a brand name, hovering over two rows a half dozen long of various watches, the circular unadorned watch faces giving way to more intricate watch casings of more varying shapes and themes as it went from left to right. The next item was a fine crystalline trophy resembling a grandfather clock with gold adornments, an actual timepiece encased within and dutifully ticking away. Accompanying it was a framed picture of a younger-looking Takehiko Tokai accepting a aforementioned award from an elderly man with white hair and beard, a line of competition-grade watches and timepieces on display across the table in the background. Off to the side were a collection of disgruntled-looking horologists twice Takehiko's age who tried and failed to hide that they utterly hated being upstaged in such a way by someone so young. Huh. The more things change, the more they stay the same. I did a bit of digging. Back before the orphanage, you were on the path to become a prodigal horologist like your parents, Hitomi spoke up, even won that big contest right, right before, she trailed off. I thought if I had this brought to you, it'd help you feel more like yourself. This, it was a touching gesture, truly, but, all it did was make my heart sink. Hitomi thought that by doing this she was giving me back a piece of my past, but all it did was hammer home the fact that by reincarnating. I'd in fact stolen a future from someone else. Someone else that could have just as easily or even not so easily. Woken up on their own if I hadn't preempted them. Something most of the Ice Guy subgenre gleefully ignored. Own. I blinked as I felt the silt in my head giving way. Something new to me, technically old, bubbling to the surface. What? Ah, uh, Takekun, are you okay? Itomi cried running up to me as I wavered. Why yeah, I'm fine, I murmured, feeling something tugging at my attention that hadn't before. Itomi, that watch, I said feeling my eyes drift. What, this? She blinked holding up a slender wrist, a watch with a triangular casing and a pink leather strap hanging upon it. Oh, Mitsumi-chan gave it to me as a gift a while back. I've been meaning to get it fixed, but, without even realizing what I was doing, my palm turned up to her, what I assumed to be an expectant look upon my face as I eyed the tiny watch hands, delicate, but inert. Oh, I see. She blinked her mono eye widely, delicate fingers undoing the tiny buckle and setting the small timepiece free. Here, like I were a passenger in my own body, it seemed to move with a mind of its own, taking hold of the timepiece and walking toward the toolbox I'd set on the table a minute before, undoing the brass case locks and unfurling the multi-tier trays once more. Flipping the clamp into position from the case's interior I set the timepiece firmly into place with a practiced hand. The phantom pain continuing as practiced hands that only recently became my own got to work. I could only spectate as I got to work on the little piece of finery, the delicate clockmaker tools like an extension of my fingers, popping the back of the watch casing free, disassembling the parts from their places, after coming upon a piece that wasn't where it belonged, rattling against the opposite of the watch face with a tooth missing. I set it to the side and fished for a replacement in the compartmentalized trays above the workstation. An equivalent replacement found a few moments later, with machine-like precision my body began to reassemble the timepiece in earnest, winding the final spring and affixing the back of the casing in place. Pressing it to my ear, a relieved sigh left my lips from some deeply forgotten place as the minute tick 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 of a timepiece freshly repaired met my ears. And if anyone ever accused me of humming the cleaner by Randy Newman while I was working, I'd call them a big fat liar. Whoa, that was so fast. Hitomi awed as my body held the timepiece out for her to take, the tiny hands in sync with its bigger relative hanging on the wall. You really are a champion clockmaker. Not me. Not anymore. I returned somberly as I carefully put the tools I'd used away, closing up my workstation and returning it to its innocuous block-like state. I'm… I'm not that person. Anymore. But you can be again. She insisted. If I took this to a shop, they might make me wait a week, or charge me more than the watch was worth. But you… You did something amazing today. Not that amazing. I muttered, and it certainly wasn't me who did it. I thought as my hands ached with a phantom pain, even though they were still attached to my body. Even if you don't remember everything about your past, your body still remembers, Hitomi said as she went through my Takehiko's effects, drawing something forth from it. More than that, the love your parents have for you, it isn't gone. It's still here. Right, here, she said pressing a finger to my chest, before laying in my palms another framed picture. This one was a family portrait. A man, a woman, their child. They were finely dressed, but not in clothes more expensive than most people's apartments. There was love there, a moment frozen in time. Yet none of it belonged to me. It belonged to the little boy who would never wake up, whose body I wore, even now, like an ill-fitting suit I couldn't quite get comfortable in. If you don't want to become a clockmaker again, if you want to do something new with this second lease you've got, that's fine too, she said reassuringly. But, don't act like your past, like your origin, is lost to you. 
When I look in your eyes with my own, I see more than most do. I like to think that by giving up my depth perception, what I got in return was the power to see into people's hearts. When you first woke up, I saw someone that was lost, panicked, confused. As I continued to care for you, I saw someone who wanted to make the most of the life they'd taken back for themselves. What I'll see in the future, maybe it isn't what you would have wanted before, but it doesn't mean it's any lesser. No matter what, as long as you're alive, you can always make new memories, for yourself, and for those that aren't with us anymore. It didn't take a rocket scientist to figure out she was talking about her own mother as a way of making me feel better about my own. And all that talk about gaining something in exchange for the depth perception she lacked. It made me realize that not having something everyone else took for granted, literally and metaphorically, it had a way of creating something new, something different. If Hitomi grew up with two eyes instead of one, would she have still become the person she is today? I never took her as one to spout philosophy, yet, her words run true somehow, resonated with something deep down inside, turning to a stack of papers among Takeko's effects, leafing through them to find a complex watch schematic and then turning back to the toolcase set out on the table, I realized something. Just because I'd reincarnated into someone else's body didn't mean I had to let the past die. Even if it wasn't mine, it was still a past I could make my own. Like I remember Shiru Emiya saying to Gilgamesh, everything here is a fake. However, there's nothing that says a fake can't rival the real thing. In doing this, in doing what he had been good at, it was the only way to keep the original Takeko Tokai alive. And there wasn't any rule saying I couldn't adopt that origin story as my own origin. Even if the future I strode toward wasn't as originally intended, Lomi coffee, understandably, Hitomi noticed Take's behavior due to their closeness, hoping she and Smith can get him somewhere safe. He was certainly letting his perceived guilt get to him during this chapter but in comes a surprise Grand Torino, and Take's disdain towards the emphasis on quirks and his respect for Wild Tiger. Can't blame him on either count, reincarnation and taking over for someone in a coma, getting their memories and traumas melding into your mind, Take's questioning himself. His personal effects are very fitting considering his new power. I'm very glad that he's choosing to move forward and that saying will fit very well with his path. I'm getting chills of excitement of what's to come. Re, yeah. Since a lot of this story is told from a first-person POV, it felt important to address something most Ice Guy ignore. The closest to that being brought up I can think of is when the guy that Thor bodyjacked back when he had a secret identity got his life back and turned into a villain, but that's neither here nor there. As for his origin, that actually relates more to his name than to his quirk, like how most of the named characters hint at their power. Takeko has two meanings in Japanese. One is Hero Prince, the other Mountain Prince. The second doesn't really apply but the first definitely does to an Ice Guy hero. Tokai is the Japanese word for a clock, a watch, a timepiece, and, or a timekeeper. Take is a reference to George Take of Star Trek fame. But in universe is a piecemeal of Takeko and Tokai. The fact that Takeko Tokai is alliterative too is another reference to Stan Lee's naming convention. Just like I did with Gokaberry Jenki in my other My Hero Academia story Vigorous Vitality, as well as my Teen Titans and Young Justice story, Harlecking 31, Silverman Jim Hay. So how heavy are the dumbbells the MC lifts? And will we get Get Rivet? Since this is a Rift Apart crossover, re, ah, glad someone caught that reference. As for how heavy, once he's 100% recovered from that year-long nap he took, he'll definitely be more athletic than the average quirkless person. I mean seriously, does anyone even remember how scrawny Izuku was before he stated actual training? As for Rift Apart, I have a plan for that and it'll be a doozy. Uh-huh, Sorohiko Torino was definitely an interesting sort, like expected of any retired hero who actually lived to retirement age instead of heroically sacrificing themselves. He had his fair share of war stories. Unlike the interviews and talk show specials filmed in Sternbuild, with him I could ask specific questions, press him for more details when a story started to get interesting. And sometimes the tangents he went off on were more interesting than my original question. I never did find out what his quirk was. Wasn't all that important. Everything he achieved belonged to him, not his quirk, which he too asserted was only a tool, just one that was a part of your own body. As for who that student of his was, he never got around to telling. I certainly didn't ask, but he made no secret that this Toshi guy went on to become a real juggernaut in the industry. He also never shied away from telling me how much of a meathead his student was, irregardless of his professional successes. But that was neither here nor there. It was still kinda hard to wrap my head around. People completely eschewing secret identities. Back in Wild Tiger's time, secret identities were still the norm, corporate sponsors notwithstanding. In fact, Barnaby Brooks who I would always call Bunny, was the first government-sanctioned hero to really break the mole. I don't know if he started the trend of heroes having their identities become part of public domain or if he was just the first to do so, but it certainly offered many fiscal opportunities. 
way more than you could have back then while still being in costume. In the few days he was at the hospital with me, Sorohiko taught me a great deal about how to fight, even how to fight quirk users. Wasn't sure if I would stay in touch with the guy once I left myself, but it couldn't hurt to have someone on call who wasn't completely enamored with the commercial age of heroes. As for my newfound hobby, whenever I wasn't working out, I was getting reacquainted with the craft, though at first glance it was all new to me. Practically Greek, like unlocking the nodes in a skill tree, I rapidly grew to understand the context of what I was reading. Though Takiko's memories weren't inherently my own, I could still make use of them like they were my own. Only real issue was I didn't have access to the table of contents, so I had to sift for those memories the old-fashioned way. I still wasn't sure what my future held, or if the eventual, inevitable collapse of hero society would happen within my lifetime. But in those few days I found more purpose for myself than I ever could have on my own. Though it was cheesy as hell to admit this, friendship really was power. Uh-huh, Takiko-kun, a voice whispered into my ear. What? What time is it? The fact Hitomi was using my real name meant it was something serious. I need you to come with me, she whispered as she kneeled at my bedside, a birthday balloon blocking the camera up in the corner. But it isn't time for my therapy yet. I said shaking the cobwebs as the clock on the wall flitted into view. Take I, Take-kun, do you trust me? Always, I replied immediately. Good, then I need you to come with me. We're getting out of here. Ah, uh, okay. What the heck? Uh-huh. Pretending to be a dead body as I'm wheeled out of the hospital. I'll admit, that's definitely a new one. The body bag I'd climbed into at a security blind spot was a little disconcerting, a little claustrophobic. But Hitomi cracked the zipper just enough that I could still breathe and catch a ray of artificial lighting. And if it got to be too much for me, she'd handed me a pink yander-style box cutter for that exact occasion. When it came to the timing of this Shawshank Redemption-esque escape, it was still dark outside the window when she'd come in. But the fact that there were still people out in the halls shuffling about yet groaning like the undead had me thinking that maybe it was so early that not everyone had gotten their morning coffee yet. If you were smuggling a dead body out of the hospital, it certainly made sense to do so when everyone's attention was lax. But why couldn't she just take me out for noodles or something and then escape? I mean it wasn't like the HPSC would try and keep me here against my will, right? Right. Oh shit, they really might, wouldn't they? Hey, you. Where are you going? The incinerator's the other way. Someone from back in the hallway shouted a few minutes into our exodus through what I assumed to be the ground floor. The fact that the wheels under my gurney were rattling louder than before was proof enough that Hitomi was starting to lose her cool. Hey, get back here. And that was proof the bad guys were on to us. An RRRGH. With what I could only assume to be adrenaline coursing through my veins, I flicked the blade of the box cutter out of its plastic sheath and got ready to do something incredibly stupid. The huh, never, you'll never take me alive. The would-be runaway said after cutting his way free of the body bag he'd been hiding in, tossing his nurse onto the gurney and getting in a pushing position himself, with what the HPSC's president could only assume to be adrenaline fueling him. Tokai Takeko and Hitomi Minaka left their pursuers firmly in the dust as they shot down the hall. If the president hadn't known any better, she'd have though Takeko were an Olympic athlete aspirant. From back when the Olympics were still a thing, at least, she'd been keeping an eye on that young man since he'd come into their care a year ago. And while the genetic material he provided had the potential to become the magic bullet that'd stop him in his tracks, it shamed her to admit that Dr. Shiga's more eccentric tendencies fell to the wayside in the presidential shuffle. The president watched the two's escape attempt with rapt attention through the security feed connected to her desk monitor. Disturbingly enough, all Takeko had to do to clear a path was scream villain. At the top of his lungs like a complete jackass, and anyone they did come across in the hall parted before them like the Red Sea. She'd heard the boy was alarmingly shrewd after waking up from his year-long coma, but to see him so blatantly take advantage of the average person's knee-jerk reaction to the V-word. Truly, it said a lot about the society they lived in that you could cry wolf and it be so effective. Whatever the boy had experienced during his coma, it must have been a hell of its own if an 11-year-old could become so jaded upon awakening. At the home stretch, the final door featuring a red exit sign. Hitomi dismounted the gurney and held it open. Takiko on the other hand, gave the gurney a mighty shove back the way they came, sending it whirling down the hallway with the force of a small motorized bicycle. A moment later, the president could only wince as the gurney struck the two guards, completely appending them in a tangle of limbs and a capsized gurney, Hitomi and Tokai making good their escape. Switching over to the most external feed, in a show of her own adrenal response, Nurse Hitomi threw Takeko over her shoulder, vaulted over the exit's railing, and bolted toward the exterior wall where a large black van with tinted windows had either just pulled in, or had been idling for a few minutes. If there was any secrecy concerning the vehicle's driver, any such mystery was swiftly abandoned as the driver's side window rolled down and a cup of coffee flew out into the nearby dumpster. 
And of course, it didn't help that Kuroko Smith leaned out of a aforementioned car window to do so. By the time Hitomi had tossed Takeko into the side passenger door, the guards from before had recovered and were already out the door. By the time they spotted her, the van was already pulling away. Damn it, they're getting away. If we put out an APB, we can still let them go, she ordered through her comm system, having seen enough. Huh, but, but ma'am, we can still. That won't be necessary. They have my permission to leave. Please return to your regular posting. I, but, okay, you're the boss. With a nod, the president looked out her window, eyeing a speck of black driving speedily away before rounding the corner and vanishing. Maybe it was Smith's van, or maybe it was another identical van, but she felt confident that Takeko would be in safe hands. Anonymity was the best security, after all. Of course, this'll be a pain in the ass to explain to the others, though, she thought to herself as she fell into her chair with an undignified grunt, her mind racing. Thanks to Dr. Shiga's quirk, they'd been able to harvest DNA samples from the child's body every few days for about a year, so they definitely had plenty in storage. And all for one was still out there, she just knew it. He might not have been in any shape to get up on his own after his last battle with All Might, but All for One had definitely had a cotter of allies willing to spirit him away after his defeat. Whether it was All for One himself, a clone and, or that quirk-stealing supervillain they'd lost track of a year ago, they needed to prepare something for when the time came. They had no idea when they'd need the magic bullet by, if they could even make it in the first place, but the loss of Takehiko's biomass would definitely impact research on that front and she was doubtful they could convince him to cooperate even if they could find a medical quirk that would cover up any scarring, because the fact that Dr. Shiga had tried to dissect him under their watch would definitely do nothing to ingratiate him toward the HPSC's goals, nor would it assuage him of their competence in keeping him safe from future-like incidents. As for why she hadn't told All Might about All for One's body going missing after their final battle, or the fact that there was a quirk stealer running around, the man had already given so much of himself for Japan. For the world, even as his health continued to deteriorate beyond the ability of modern medicine to remedy, she owed it to the symbol of peace to let him find and train his successor at his own pace, telling him without being able to do anything about it would only hurt his morale. She would of course have to personally ensure that Hitomi wasn't punished for what she had done. As the boy's nurse, it was her ethical and moral duty to ensure his safety and health, and if she allowed him to be experimented upon now that he was awake, she'd have failed in both regards. Not to mention, if the HPSC did try to experiment on a living test subject, the whole thing could devolve into a PR nightmare. Though what had truly transpired with Lady Nagant had been covered up under the pretense of her going rogue. The bigger problem was that they'd had more failures and scandals of epic proportions since then. And though they had a spy, they no longer had an enforcer of equivalent caliber. If the public ever found out they'd experimented on a comatose body that they could get away with. What they couldn't get away with was if it got out they were carving up a live person. Doubly so if they tried to do so against his will. America, Russia, and China could get away with shit like that. They were big countries with lots of places to hide their dirty little secrets, lots of people to do the actual hiding, and quirk users ran amok doing as they pleased creating plenty of distractions. But in Japan, there was no way they could do so for very long. It was a miracle they'd been able to keep the truth of all for one as nothing more than an urban legend parents told their unruly kids to make them behave. Truly, the quirk-reliant society they all lived in was a double-edged sword. She could only hope that Tokai Takeko, even bereft of his quirk, would be able to make a peaceful life for himself. After all the boy had endured, he deserved nothing less. The uh huh, stop looking out the back. It looks suspicious, Miss Smith replied from the driver's seat. Oh believe me, I would if I could, but I can't because there is some luggage in the way. Moo, you big meanie, calling a delicate maiden luggage. A aforementioned luggage pouted from the rear of the black van. She was a very tall woman, dressed almost identically to Miss Smith, her skin a luscious tan, her eyes a lovely red, and her flowing hair an elegant blonde going down to her waist. She had fangs, pointed ears, breasts bigger than my own had a piece, but more noticeable even than that, probably, was a single large red horn protruding from her forehead. I couldn't tell how tall she was because she was sitting with her ankles crossed and her body stooped forward in the van's spacious rear, but she was definitely more than seven feet tall and very curvaceous. It also made me think that this van must have been modded out the wazoo. Otherwise there's no freaking way the rear bumper wouldn't be dragging across the ground. She wasn't fat by any means beyond her breasts which technically were fat, so I could only assume she was crazy strong since muscle weighs more than fat. The fact that she likely wielded the massive anti-tank shields flanking her in the back of the van was the only evidence I had to go on, though. Why is she here, exactly? In case we needed a little muscle Ms. Smith replied casually. I mean, sure, if we needed to flip an Abrams tank over. Anything short of that and... Tanishia. My friends call me Tio she greeted sweetly. 
and Tia would be quadruple overkill, I finished. Thank you for extracting us from that sticky situation. You're welcome, Ms. Smith replied. I didn't get to do anything though. Tio pouted cutely. Jeez, was everything this lady did cute? Maybe next time, Hitomi replied kindly. Although, I might be out of a job by now. Just tell them I put you up to it, I replied. Say all my working out and eschewing my hobbies was a desperate cry for help and it should blow over. I can't ask you to do that for me. You're not. I'm telling you to tell them that of my own volition. Of course, they might drag me back anyway. Well then, it's a good thing we have a workaround Ms. Smith grinned. Well that doesn't sound ominous at all. Hey, the huh. Leaving the Chiyoda Special Ward in Tokyo behind us, our ultimate destination was Asakashi in the nearby Saitama Prefecture, a spot of research with my tablet, which I guess I wound up taking with me without even realizing, told me that Asakashi was known for having a higher percentile of heteromorphs per square kilometer than was the norm, architecture tailored toward plus-size body types, and little else besides. Prime rates were low, more a result of the increased concentration of heteromorphs than anything All Might did, since quirk restriction laws had less bearing on heteromorphs whose quirks couldn't be turned off like transformation or emitter-type meta-ability. Amazingly enough, quirk bias was lower than normal as well, though that may have been born of a community that remembered when the inverse was true and an unwillingness to repeat the mistakes of a storied past, with an hour's drive between here and there. Barring any villain-related incidents on the highway, there was more than enough time for me to ask. So, what happens now? Now, Smith hummed, now we stop you from becoming a ward of the state. And how do we do that exactly? By making you a ward of me. Is there a third option? I ask hopefully, since something in my gut tells me this woman is a bit of a slacker. Hey, that's not very nice, Smith pouted. Don't worry, Takekun, everything will work out. Itomi said earnestly beside me. There are good people waiting to take you in, and we've got you set up to go to Demoto Junior High in the spring along with Mitsumi-chan. Soon enough you'll have loads of friends. I don't need loads of friends to be happy. Just a few really good ones, I say letting my thoughts on the matter slip. Something I learned a long time ago was that being the popular kid didn't mean jack shit outside those doors. It was what you knew, now who knew you, that would have any bearing on your future. No one reading your resume cared if you were the cool kid or if you were declared most likely to succeed in the school yearbook, since stuff like that was completely arbitrary. Aoua, you sounded so mature just then. Tanishia squealed with twinkling eyes, reaching up and mussing my hair, and almost breaking my neck in the process. Anyway, glad you made it out in time for Thanksgiving Kuroko grin. We were going to just grab a chicken from KFC, but I think this year we'll go all out and treat you as a way of celebrating you getting out of the slammer. Will there be rice stuffing? I found myself blurting out loud, my hands going to my lips as my cheeks reddened. Never heard of it, but sure, we'll whip some up for ya. You know the recipe. Yeah, I returned awkwardly, hoping no one would dig too deeply into what Takeko's family had for Thanksgiving, since this was exactly the sort of inconsistency that had oust me as an imposter. Did it count as being an imposter if you were reincarnated? Are you worried about something? Tanisha asked aloud. Don't worry, there's nothing to be scared of moving to a new place. We'll keep you safe. It's nothing like that. Just, a crisis of identity I guess. Well, don't you worry about that. Every boy going through puberty feels that way, Smith hummed cheekily. And hey, if you have any awkward questions, you've always got a hot nurse on speed dial you can call. Yeah, just one problem with that. I don't actually have a phone, I said offhandedly. Shit, you're right. Kiroko swore, my face hitting the window as she suddenly veered off toward an exit. Uh-huh, 37 minutes later. Are you sure that's all you want? Kiroko asked as we walked out of the electronics store, an ordinary-looking touchscreen phone equipped with a screen protector and phone case in my hand. I can always get you something a little more expensive, charge it to the agency's flex account. Is that really something you should be telling me as your ward? I deadpan at the suit-clad woman as I compare the phone in my hand to what I had in my previous life. Even though it was the 22XXS, the only major advancement in commercially available cell phone technology was that the highest-end models had free-floating hologram projection technology like something out of Yu-Gi-Oh! While currently available models were thinner and more flexible, and even smaller in the case of some support items used by heroes, I didn't count those as advancements because those were more about the form of the cellular phone, not the innate function. For my purposes, all I needed was something functionally equivalent to the iPhone 11, which I remember having before I got Ice Guide. I wasn't sure if I'd be able to find all my favorite artists on this alternate earth, but seeing as how I'd gotten my fill of app games and didn't want to go down that rabbit hole again, all I'd really used this one for was music and phone calls, maybe a bit of wireless internet. Something else I idly noticed while we were inside getting a phone for me on the Hero Agency plan was that VR technology from a recreational standpoint was practically Ready Player One or Sword Art Online level, albeit the digital infrastructure wasn't quite up to fictitious standards. 
and the level of immersion wasn't as deep. The sales rep tried to sell us on a model that Hero Academies were beginning to use for their training regiments, allegedly. But annoyingly enough, I was the one who had to keep us on task and stop Ms. Smith from buying one under the guise of Christmas shopping. All this talk about VR games did have me idly curious what kind of console and PC games there were out there in the world. But given how much time I'd sunk into tea in my previous life, I figured I could hold off on that sort of thing for a while yet. But first, I'd have to make peace with whatever it meant to become the ward of Kiroko Smith. And this mod agency she'd brought up when it came time to assign phone plans on my SIM card. Zombasluth, I just now realized that Agent Smith is a monster musum reference. Harlecking 31, victory. Tio best girl fight me. Sorry I got excited where was I? Oh yes, will there be darling cameo? If this OC is meeting Mido will he mention something about a Torino to Green Boy and All Might may or may not overhear. Actually that'd be pretty interesting. 3. Daily life with Monster Girl is an old favorite of mine. And all in all, it's just so much more fun working them into the world of my hero academia instead of making a bunch of OCs from scratch. I mean sure, I pride myself in my well-crafted original characters, niche as it is, but multi-crossovers are just a joy to write because they create so much opportunity, with so many possibilities so yes, you can expect to see more of Mon Musu showing up. As for Yue, that's where he's heading, but there's going to be so much more nuance to it than that. Lomi Coffee, fantastic chapter. Literally what the chapter title is. It's rare for me to see the grain as shown in the HPSC as usually in story. I see them being corrupt as hell and simply not wanting to lose the power they've accumulated. Their version has valid explanations for why they haven't told All Might about All for One's survival and why they're letting Teikiko go. It's great, and it provokes more thinking in my head. And we have Tio, my huggable back-breaking waifu I'm quite in favor of the destination for them. A community of heteromorphs. This is going to be interesting and he's a ward of Mon, a favorite group of mine. Such lovely ladies. I'm getting chills. Re, well, as I got older, I realized there was this little thing known as nuance, that the world wasn't white and black, but infinite shades of gray. This discovery became reflective in my writing as I introduced more of it into my works, instead of having a strict dichotomy of good v evil. It also helped when I started watching lore videos and learned how messed up the Jedi Order from Star Wars was, one example among many. That my take on the HPSC was thought-provoking as a joy to hear, because compared to Tiger and Bunny and One Punch Man, there's a great deal of nuance between respective hero organizations that run the whole thing. As for Mon, they're a favorite group of mine that could fit well into the world of my hero academia, and it's a lot more satisfying working a pre-existing group into a story world, instead of trying to fill it with a fleet of OCs no one will remember. Big fan, good stuff, man hell great stuff. Keep it up hey quick question have you heard or seen new series Arcane? League of Legends. Re, yeah, saw Arcane, but never played League of Legends so I wouldn't be able to write something faithfully. Which is kind of my number one rule. Never write a story, crossover, or cameo unless you're, I'm familiar enough with the material to do it justice. Because if there's one thing that can totally kill a story for me, it's reading a story by someone that doesn't know what the hell they're talking about. I mean I am interested in getting Ruin King, a League of Legends story because it plays just like Battle Chasers, Night War, which was massively fun for me to the play to the point I sought out the original source material. But the problem is, I still have a huge backlog of games I got from Steam and Epic Games on sale, so it would be a while before I made a hypothetical Battle Chasers x League of Legends crossover, which is the angle I would take since, with League of Legends rich variety, it'd be hard for me to make any OC that doesn't come off as a reskin, which, unironically, is the problem I have with most poorly written OC-centric stories. Uh-huh. From what Kiroko was willing to divulge once we got back on the road, I was going to be living in a guest room within the apartment complex that the Mon Agency owned. It meant I'd be rooming with five other ladies, Smith included, but considering I was still a little kid in their eyes, they didn't seem to have any sort of problem with that. I guessed Atomi had a significant amount of pull with them if they were willing to take in a complete stranger. I was definitely grateful to get out of the hospital, make no mistake about that, but I figured living with five attractive ladies would be an utter hell for me once puberty came about full swing. The whole thing had lucky pervert moment written all over it. Not that I'd ever tell them that. Point of fact, I'd be meeting the rest of my roomies today, so I might as well bite the bullet. I wasn't going anywhere else for a good while. Uh-huh. The Mon Apartments, apparently home to members of multiple hero agencies and their tangential affiliates, looked like a completely ordinary four-story upper-middle-class apartment building. Lush foliage around the ground floor offsetting a white concrete exterior, beige-colored boards walling the balcony. A robust fence on the roof housing a large public space, and on each side a zigzagging exterior stairwell surrounded by glass pane walls. I was tempted to ask how one agency could afford an entire building, 
which they were possibly collecting rent from. But I just held my tongue and assumed they saved the life of some bigwig somewhere down the line and Kuroko wrung the deed out of them, or gave it over of their own free will. With how curvy she was, on top of Japan being known for its sexual predators and repressed perverted tendencies, at least in my time, world, it wasn't that far of a leap in logic to take. The ceilings, I noticed, were slightly higher than on the hospital wing I'd been staying in, most likely for those whose quirks made them taller than average, which was evidenced by how Tio didn't have to slouch but could instead stand at her full height, venturing through the first floor common area with my escort of three lovely ladies. While I felt the eyes of those lounging about land on me, I chose to ignore it as I took the space in. It looked like a receiving space for visitors, a meeting point for friends, somewhere to go if you wanted to step out of a stuffy apartment but not want to venture off into a sakashi proper. While we were perfectly capable of taking the stairs, Kuroko waved some sort of badge over the panel for what I assumed was an express elevator, and we made our way up, Tio humming to herself as we rose from ground level. Following that, we stepped out into the landing. The number of apartments fewer I assumed than were on the lower floors. Something else I noticed on the way up was that this building seemed to be more robustly built than the buildings I'd been in before I'd reincarnated. It was one thing to read about it, and another to see it inside and out. Eventually we arrived at our destination, Hitomi letting out a relived sigh and no longer looking over her shoulder, while Kuroko fiddled with a ring of keys before finding the right one for the lock, and swung the door wide. To our shock to varying degrees, there was someone waiting for us, though it was less about that there was something there and more about what they looked like. They had skin as fair as snow, a narrow waist, wide hips, a G-cup chest, their ebony black hair pulled up in a ponytail, and a jewel-colored mono eye. Apart from the short, frilly pink apron she was wearing, there wasn't a stitch of clothing on her. Welcome home, take Hiko-sama would you like dinner, a bath, or me? The woman that looked exactly like Hitomi Minaka cooed seductively. Hiroko. Rubbed the bridge of her nose, Tio, hid her blushing face behind her hands, Hitomi, was frozen in a rictus of horrified shock, and as for me, bop bop boop, yes, 110, I'd like to report a sexual predator in my area. Whoa, hold on a second, Hiroko cried out as she grabbed for my phone. Dapple, what have I said about impersonating people that aren't dead yet? She cried as I pulled away from her, the 110 people putting me on hold. Geez, you never said we were living with a stiff, Hitomi's lookalike huffed indignantly, her blinking eye changing to gold with black sclera as she put her hands on her hips, chest bouncing tantalizingly. Between me being a stiff and you being a sexual predator, which do you think the police will care about more? I taunted, and that's the story of how I met the Mon Agency's resident shapeshifter. Uh huh. After Kuroko stopped the local constables from registering one of the Mon Agency's heroes as a sex offender, I was ushered inside. I didn't know what I was or wasn't expecting when I got there. As far as furnishings went, the place looked completely ordinary. Nothing overtly cutesy or feminine in the kitchen or common areas, but the chairs were definitely well used and well cared for. With a plus-size sofa big enough for someone like Tio to comfortably use, the appliances upper middle end, the fridge extra large. All things considered, it looked like a well-cared-for place lived in by five people, now six including me. Which reminds me for whatever reason. I'm surprised no one raised a stink about my hospital scrubs. I hummed as I looked down at my state of dress, taking the time to realize I'd actually gone out in public looking like this. No wonder it was so cold outside. Oh, it's actually more common than you'd think for a person's entire wardrobe to be destroyed by a villain. Hiroko waved off as she guided me down the hallway past a number of doors with tailored signs on them. So what will I be wearing then? I asked aloud. Oh, I had two sans send over some of Fumio-kun's hand-me-downs. I hope you don't mind, Hitomi hummed nervously. I don't have a problem with hand-me-downs, don't worry about it, I replied. While I had never received hand-me-downs before reincarnating, being the first born in my family before I reincarnated, Hitomi had possibly put her job and her professional reputation in jeopardy for me. There was no way in hell I'd spit in her eye like that just because the clothes I'd be wearing from now on were second-hand. As long as they were clean and bereft of suspicious stains, nothing else really mattered. I preferred a blend of form and function, but brand names didn't mean shit to me. Well, here's your room, Kuroko said once we got to the end of the hall. After we sort out what kind of allowance you'll be getting, you can decorate it however you want, she said swinging the door in. Until then, make yourself at home. The room itself wasn't too big, wasn't too small, mostly done in neutral colors. It had a single window facing the Asaka Shisidescape in the distance. Ordinary-looking furniture a bedroom would come prefurbished with, a closet off to the side, and a western-style bed in the corner. Situated next to the dressers were cardboard boxes filled with clothes. Hey, Kiroko. Hitomi pouted. You were supposed to have it all unpacked by the time we got here. Well, what if the way Takei-chan organizes his clothes is different from mine? Ms. Smith readily deflected. You just wanted to get out of doing more work. 
It's all right. Miss Smith is probably right about that. Anyway, I said trying to smooth things over. I always was rather particular about how I packed my belongings. Was? Hiroko blinked. Be back when I still had stuff, why you know. I stuttered. Crap, did I let something slip? I thought nervously. Anyway, I said digging into the nearest box. Ah, uh, Hitomi, I think some of your sunglasses got mixed in with the bunch. I say holding up a black rectangular mono lens sunglasses. Oh, no, those are Fumio Kuns too. He grew into his mono eye after puberty hit while I had mine from the start. She said flipping out her phone before showing what was obviously a more recent photo. Like Hitomi, he now had a mono eye, but with two pupils instead of just one, which had me wondering if he technically had binocular vision or not. He also had pointed teeth, and he looked grumpy as hell. His attire consisted of black pants and a hoodie with fur lining the hood, and at the moment he stood in front of a moving van looking like he just wanted to get going already. I guess this more recent photo was taken when Fumio moved out of the house to go to college, though that had me wondering why she didn't show me a more up-to-date photo the first time around. HM. Doesn't quite fit. I hum as I try them on, just for kicks. With the sunglasses nose guard in place, half the darkened lens covered my forehead, doing little to actually shield my eyes, which I guess made sense. Glasses tailored to binocular vision had the nose guard between the two lenses, while for a mono eye, the nose guard would be below the eye. Cool design though. I hum admiring the rectangular lens, since turning to the nearby mirror, it kinda looked like a sensor bar. The rest of Fumio's hand-me-downs were pretty ordinary. Long pants, shorts, graphic TS, blank TS, long sleeves, jackets, hoodies, a few nicer outfits with button-up shirts. I'd have to give the sneakers and socks a try, but beyond that, everything else looked like it fit. If this were a video game or a nice guy genre manga with a game style format, this would be the point where I got a notification that said, uh huh, after getting everything packed away just the way I liked it. Kiroko, T.O., weird question to ask, but what's the bathroom situation like living here Jesus fucking Christ? What? You never seen a chocolate lowly before? Aforementioned chocolate lowly questioned with a raised brow and a cock of her hip. She was a tiny little thing, barely more than four feet tall, in the form of a small, petite young girl with budding curves. Her skin was a dark dark brown and luscious like chocolate. Her almond-shaped eyes gold with black sclere with a mischievous glint, thin eyebrows, and her long platinum-colored hair coiled prehensile lie around her body in a spiral down to her ankles just above her bare feet, arranged in such a way that if she were naked, would have just barely skirted censorship laws in a graphic medium. Her quote-unquote outfit consisted of a teeny weeny itty bitty black and white bikini, and shorty short short shorts so small and sheer, they may as well have been drawn on her skin with marker. I hope that was how small and sheer they were and that they weren't actually drawn on with marker. You, the sex predator. I blurted out before my filter could stop it. Jeez, and here I thought boys her age were still interested in TNA, she said striking a pose, her hair continuing to strategically place itself between my eyes and her. Delicate areas. I'm eleven. I growled, partly in anger, partly in embarrassment, and partly at being eleven again in the hellish cocktail of pubescent hormones to follow. Oh shit, really? She blinked. Yes, really. I repeated. Oh, well then, her hair swirling around her body and flaring out like a curtain, a moment later she had transformed into a pretty, petite Japanese schoolgirl with shoulder-length black hair clad in a white summer sailor uniform with a black pleated skirt, a black collar with white stripes and cuffs to match, and a red scarf. Her limbs were long and slender, her thigh-high stockings drawing one's attention toward her legs, and if it weren't for the shape of her eyes, face, and the swirling cowlick still present atop her head, I'd have thought some stranger wandered into the apartment by accident. That was how flawless her transformation was. So ooh, if we could just keep that little mishap at the front door between the two of us, I'd really appreciate not getting written up again, she said with an awkward wave of her hand in front of her face, having the decency to look bashful. How many times have you been written up? Too damn many. Hiroko called out from the kitchen. Doppel, Take-chan. Take-chan, Doppel. Make sure you get along. And no more walking around the house naked. She ordered. At least not until Hitomi has given him the talk she amended with a chuckle. I can already tell you're going to be a bad influence. I deadpanned at her for what felt like the fifth time among many. Which is exactly why everyone in Mon will be given joint custody. Kiroko grinned behind her coffee mug. Lucky you. Having five smock and hot moms looking out for you six if you count Hitomi. Christ, was she hopped up on calf 24-7? Oh please, that's just another excuse to get out of doing more work, Doppel said with a flat-lidded stare. And as for the bathroom situation, she said turning back to me. You're sharing an apartment with five chicks, what do you think? Doppel, don't tease him, Tio pouted from her place on the plus-sized sofa. You know we have a guest bathroom he can use. Not like it'll do much good between six of us, Doppel shrugged. Just do your best to ignore the lingerie and feminine hygiene products, and you'll do just fine. Probably she grinned salaciously. 
Don't worry, if we scar you for life, just wait until puberty and you'll be able to clear your palate. Oh joy. What? Did I reincarnate into a cheesy harem anime where everyone was into little boys? Christ, I couldn't wait for my second puberty to be over with. And was Takiko even a Christian in the first place? Does it count as converting if this body is Buddhist or some other Eastern religion and not Christian by default? An inquiry for another day. Uh-huh. Well, Hitomi, I think you're pretty much in the clear. Kiroko hummed a while later as the lot of us sat on the plus-sized couch and channel surfed. If they were going to fire you for that little breakout, they'd have called you out on it by now. Ah, that's, that's good. The mono eye sighed, relieved. Takekun, I'll have Kamenaga bring anything we left behind our way after work. How's she going to get there? Wasn't I in some kind of private floor or something? I should probably go with her. She amended, getting up from her seat and getting ready to head out. Good luck, I called out, albeit lamely. You're sure she'll be safe out there? Well, I mean, as safe as someone can be in this country, Kiroko shrugged. We don't have too many villains here that can level a whole city block or anything, but we do have enough troublemakers around to bring in a decent paycheck, even between the five of us. Hmm, I guess if she gets into a bind, she can fire another eye laser. S-P-U-R-R-R-R-T. Holy shit, that was real? Doppel gopped after spewing her drink. I thought that was just one of her drunken, chuny fantasies. Well, I mean, it was a recent development. I admitted. Thump S-H-F-F-F, thump S-H-F-F-F, thump S-H-F-F-F. Ooh, what was that? I blinked as something thumped and shuffled its way down the hallway from the bedrooms. Gruwag, the hairs on the back of my neck standing on end, my head mechanically turning. Shambling around the corner was a patchwork woman, looking like she were stitched together from numerous pieces like Dr. Frankenstein's monster. Her left iris green, her right yellow. Both were glazed as her sharp and pointed teeth gnashed angrily together, her shoulder-length hair messy and dark red. Her breasts large, her figure slender and curvaceous, she was clad in little more than a green pair of panties and a dark green loose-fitting tank top, my tactical time dilation flaring in my panic at the mere sight of her. Her shambling body halting as the second hand on the nearby clock slowed to a ghost of a crawl, my eyes remained wide as I took in every detail, every line of stitches, every skin graft, her countenance, everything that marked her undeniably as a member of the undead. Faced with such a creature, as time resumed, I did the most sensible thing I could think of before I became terrified beyond the capacity for rational thought. Aha. Uh -huh. Crash. Oh. Take Hiko, what the hell? The zombie-like woman cried after getting a bar stool broken over her head. How do you know my name? Take Hiko cried in retaliation. Well, that could have gone better. Miss Smith deadpanned as the prior chased the ladder around the living room in a shambling gait, the ladder throwing whatever wasn't bolted to the floor at the prior, starting with the stool legs in his hands. Think we should tell him. No, nah, give it five. Ten minutes, tops, Doppel replied holding up a phone with her prehensile hair, recording the whole thing with a grin on her face. Uh-huh, suffice it to say, that was monumentally embarrassing. D-A-A-M and you eleven-year-old Bri? Of course, given how much damage a zombie epidemic could do to an island nation like Japan, could I really be blamed for my reaction? Hell, with around 5 billion possible quirk or quirk combinations thereof on this planet, the possibility of there being some sort of zombification quirk was alarmingly high, maybe not mathematically high, but that the possibility existed was what frightened me the most. All things considered, Zambina was surprisingly cool with it after I explained my reasoning. And not so surprisingly, I wasn't the first person to wig the fuck out when seeing her for the first time after she'd just woken up. Something else I learned about her was she seemingly had no sense of shame or personal boundaries. Because after I had apologized, she put me in a headlock that smooshed my face directly into her rather impressive bosom under the pretense of giving me a nookie. Lady had a rockin' bod, but between how cold and clammy she was, and how she didn't jiggle, it was a little confusing. And no, I don't interpret my hypothetical boner as me being a necrophiliac. Her blood might have been replaced with a preservative blood-like fluid, but her synapses were still firing, I assume, so I didn't count her functionally as being dead, even if her pulse was largely non-existent. And speaking of which, while she technically was a carrier for some kind of zombie virus, it was actually incredibly weak compared to the one-scratch-one-kill varieties you see in popular media. The only people Zambina's particular strain was effective against were those who were already immunocompromised, AIDS, miscellaneous rare diseases, etc. Anyone remotely healthy would be able to fight it off under their own power. And since I'd become a bit notorious for being a fast healer, I basically had nothing to worry about from her. Which of course, brought up a more pressing question. So do you just, you know, go by your hero name or something? Nope, Zambina is my legit, legal name. She grinned. Wanna hear how I got it? Sure, why not? Not like anything else could possibly upset me today. Uh-huh. So, yeah, turns out what came next could possibly upset me after everything I'd been through. 
to make the whole thing relatively palatable for the 11-year-old they thought they were talking to, seemingly ignoring the fact that I'd had my parents killed, my quirk stolen, and almost been vivisected on three non-sequential occasions by three unrelated villains. Basically, I was told that Sinbina had forgotten her original name after some bad men in a van did something horrible to her in the back of said van, and that they then left her out in the woods where she became unalive. Because her brain had been left intact, her quirk was able to trigger because it had the rare posthumous quirk activation threshold. After shambling her way back to town where her missing persons report had been waiting for her, once she'd oriented herself, she pointed the finger at the bad men from the van who did the bad things to her in the van. Once that snafu had gotten resolved, she got her posthumously activated quirk registered, had her strain of the zombie virus rigorously analyzed to find out how it worked, arranged for her bi-monthly preservative fluid oil changes, got her hero license from an accredited technical college a while later, and the rest, as they say, was history. Of course, to my reincarnated brain, which wasn't nearly as stupid or gullible as they assumed it to be, two words immediately came to mind, rape van. I'd read about the troop in fanfiction. Read a statistic somewhere I'd long forgotten, saw it for the first time in the Killing Bites manga right before the main heroine Hitomi Yuzaki went full on where honey badger form and tore the guys to shreds, and I'd always just assumed no one in real life would be dumb enough to try it because an enclosed space like a van with no windows was a really shitty place to have a terrified, scared shitless woman discharge her quirk at point-blank range while you literally had your pants down. As for the victim of this story, even after she'd been told her real name by the police who identified her by her dental records and fingerprints, the nom de guerre Sambina simply stuck with her. Maybe it was originally meant as an insult from some petty asshole who got off on making people who'd literally died feel small after they not died, but she turned it on its head and made it her own as a point of pride. Wouldn't be the first time something like that happened, I suppose. Someone calls you bitch, you turn it into something empowering, and suddenly bitch stops becoming an insult altogether. Supposedly, me being a guy in my previous life, I was never called bitch in the exacting context that a woman would be called bitch, nor was I ever called nerd for that matter. Wallflower, maybe, but nothing overtly derogatory. All of the latter of course was implied rather than outright spoken in the declarative sense, and given how much effort they'd put into trying to make it PG-13. I decided to let them think they'd spared me all the graphic details. Suo, I hummed looking for something to change the subject. If you aren't technically dead, why were you shuffling down the hall like a zombie? Oh, you know, Zambina said sheepishly scratching her cheek. I forgot to do my stretches before bed. Rigor Morty set in before I woke up, and, well, I think you can figure out the rest. Shouldn't that be part of your routine you've done to death? Pun not intended, I swiftly amended, like your bi-monthly oil change. Yeah, well... Sometimes I just get lazy after a long day of work and want to sleep in. Well, the next time this happens, I'll make sure not to break a barstool over your head. Much appreciated. Welcome to the family, kiddo. She said wrapping her arm around my neck and smooshing my face into her right can. My protests muffled and my flailing limbs ignored. Uh-huh. Okay, so we've got Kiroko, Tio, Doppel, and Zambina. I counted as we all got dinner ready. Where's Minako? On loan to the nearby police academy. She should be coming through that door right. I'd a bow -oot. Now, Kiroko said from her spot on the barstool supervising. In and in now. Now. In and in no uwa. Kiroko, repeatedly saying now isn't going to. Knock knock hey guys, I'm home. A tired sounding voice suddenly called out from the entryway. Kiroko shooting me a self-satisfied smile while I resisted urge to give her the finger. How'd the breakout at the hospital go? Anyone get arrested this time? This time? How many people have you smuggled out of hospitals before me? I asked incredulously, barely able to believe that needed asking. More than I'd like to admit, fewer than I'm proud of, Kiroko shrugged, not even going to pretend I know what that meant. Turning my attention to the entryway where a large caliber sniper rifle was being propped against the nearby wall, a part of me was immediately put at ease by the face that greeted me. A mono eye like Hitomi a little under five feet tall with a slender build. She had a single cyclopean eye that was a lovely purple color to match her hair, which was done in a short, shoulder-length bob cut. Something I noticed about her look was that while Hitomi's bangs were cut around her mono eye and drew attention toward it, Minako's bangs did the opposite, half covering hers. Her attire looked like a blend between a hero costume and a member of the SWAT team. With a black neck-length catsuit as the base, over it she wore black fingerless gloves, combat boots, yellow sleeves with brown trim and angular metal pads on her elbows and knees, a yellow flak vest with orange shoulder pads, and a brown utility belt with orange pouches. Underneath the Mon insignia on her right breast were two lines of bullet-shaped stamps, like the victory decals you'd find on the side of a fighter or a bomber plane, which made me wonder if they meant confirmed kills, or something less direct like big busts against villain organizations. 
All in all, she was cute as hell, and based on how her cheeks were lighting up red after the way I felt my face starting to heat up, I could only assume my blushing had triggered hers. H hello, it's nice to meet you. I bowed, hoping neither Kuroko nor Doppel would see my expression. H hello, it's nice to meet you too. Minako replied nervously with a bow of her own. Um, do you want me to put your sniper rifle away? Draw a bath. And no, thank you. But, if you could open my door for me, she said shouldering her beast of a rifle, I'd really appreciate it. Looks like someone's got a crushed apple purred. Damn it, someone did see. I wasn't even going to deny it. Now that she'd gotten the idea in her head, any form of denial would be construed as a confirmation of aforementioned crush. Uh-huh. Um, Takeko kun Please, call me Take. It's what I want my friends to call me, I offered, hoping I was being polite. Ah, uh, Take-kun, she nodded. I. Apologize if any of my roommates were a bit much. It's fine. I basically got inoculated to a bit much back in the hospital. I returned, thinking back to Kamenaga, who would be a bit much for any sensible person. I figured, but didn't want to assume, that you're Hitomi's friend who mediated my whole breakout. That's right, she nodded. Hitomi and I met at an eyeglasses store that caters to mono eyes. We've stayed in touch since, and, after you woke up and things got difficult, she reached out to me and I convinced the rest of my team to take you in. I'm grateful, but I'm sorry if I inconvenience any of you, I say bowing my head. I understand how much of a burden another mouth to feed can be. No, no, it's fine, she said waving her hands frantically. Honestly, if we can't even save one boy from a bad situation, what kind of heroes would we be? HM. Well, I'm glad to know you're some of the good ones. I couldn't be in better hands. But, I mean, we aren't all that famous. She returned dejectedly. Outside of town, no one really knows who we are. Just because you aren't famous nationwide doesn't mean you aren't great heroes. It isn't about doing big things. Sometimes, it's about doing the right thing, even when no one is looking, I asserted. You four might not be household names like the guy that shows off too much teeth, or the grumpy guy that lights his mustache on fire, or that other guy who wears way too much denim. I listed off, eliciting a small chuckle from the cute, mono eye. But to me, you're my heroes. You took me and even when there wasn't anything in it for you in return, agreed to protect me from being some nutjob science experiment. And even if I can't pay you back right away. Setting her sniper rifle aside, Minako stepped forward and held me with deceptive strength, her eye watering onto my shoulder. How can you still trust us? How can you still have faith in us when you've lost so, so much? And us heroes weren't there for you when you needed us most. She questioned somberly. Right now, faith is all I have to my name. Trust might be an expensive commodity, that much is true. But Hitomi trusts you, so I don't mind turning out my pockets for all of you here at Mon. I answer, hoping that sounded less corny in my head as I reciprocated the gesture. You're a good boy, Takekun. Minako smiled, gently patting my head. If you ever need someone to scrub your back and not make it weird like the others, I'll be there. Ooh, grooming him early, ain't Chamana Chan. Hoping he'll be a good looking stud after high school. Zizambina, don't ruin what was supposed to be a tender moment. Oh trust me, Takekun isn't going to be tender for much longer the zombie woman grinned salaciously, causing Minako's face to explode in a crimson blush to the roots of her hair. The cute mono eye stuttering protests impotently. Hey, stop picking on her, you hopping zombie. I snapped out. Note to self, come up with better material. I ain't Chinese. I'm Japanese. The Chinese have a wool other thing going on. Run, save yourself. I whisper waving Minako toward the open door, now that Zambina was sufficiently distracted. Uh-huh. Girls, a toast. To our young ward. Hiroko grinned after we'd all convened at the dinner table, a can of beer in her hand. Here, here, Doppel and Zambina crooned while Tio sipped at her strawberry milk and Minako her tea. Hey, Take, Mon's leader said my way. Sorry Hitomi and her family couldn't be here for this. I guess we were all still in the headspace. That the HPSC wouldn't let you go without a fight. Kuroko said noticing my somber expression. Guess I can't put anything past you, huh? I hummed. Not on your best day. Kid she grinned, chugging her beer without a care in the world. Don't worry. If they didn't have you on lockdown after that quack of a doctor tried to strip you for parts, I don't think the HPSC was all that against letting Old Yeller run free. Didn't they shoot Old Yeller in the end? I asked while the rest of Mon exchanged confused looks. Urk, didn't think you'd catch that. Hiroko deadpanned, probably wishing she had a stronger beer. So you really are a history buff, Minako hummed with a small smile on her face. Only for niche history. My world history's a bit rusty, and when was the last time schools cared about anything that happened before quirks were a thing? I don't know. I barely paid attention in school, Zambina shrugged. Why did they shoot old Yeller? Tio whined pitiably. Really? That's what you fixate on? Doppel questioned. Apparently so, I hummed. Excuse me, Minako, can I ask you a question? W what kind of question? Minako stammered. 
Hitomi has one eye and one eyebrow. Mitsumi has three eyes but two eyebrows, yet you have one eye and two eyebrows. Is the number of eyebrows not a constant among mono eyes, or match for people with more than two? And here I thought you were going to ask if she were a middle schooler. Zizambina. Minako cried, sounding affronted. As for the eyebrow thing, honestly, I never gave it much thought, she said turning back to me. What brought this on? Well, Itomi's was the first face I saw after waking up from that year-long power nap, and I guess maybe I got enamored by mono eyes. I said trying to find the right word. Minako for her part blushed, brushing her bangs down over her mono eye. Maybe this doesn't mean a lot coming from me, I said taking notice, but I think you have a really pretty eye, and it's such a shame for you to hide it. As sorry but, I'm not nearly as confident as Hitomi. Are you still on about the whole boob thing? Zambina asked flat out. Because if you are, most Japanese guys are into smaller breasts. Guys liking big honking melons is a western thing. Right? Take Chan. I wouldn't know. I'm not a westerner. Also, I'm 12. Technically 11. Same fucking thing. I snapped Kiroko's way. Well, nice to see our new mascot has some teeth Zambina grinned. Welcome to the family. Take Chan. Tio grinned. Everything going black as I was smothered by her enormous bosom. And that's the story of how I met my mothers.